Good afternoon, everyone. Am I on? Uh, no. Uh, okay, sorry. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Please take your seats and please silence your cell phones. We'll be right with you. Thank you. Let me just check, is sound okay? Welcome everyone, thank you for being here. My name is Jacob Nadal, I'm Director for Preservation here at the Library of Congress. We are pleased to be hosting you all for this held and trust convening uh, and ask everyone to now take their seats before you begin, uh, including those of you over in the members room, welcome. Uh, the Library of Congress was founded in 1800 and the Jefferson Building in which we are meeting today opened in 1897. 
The Library of Congress sits on the traditional homeland of the Piscataway, the Kochtank, Pamunkey, and Manahoac nations. We acknowledge the traditional owners and sovereign custodians of the land on which we live and work. We extend our respects to their ancestors and all First Nations people and elders past, present, and future. Let me now invite FAIC Board President Peter Trippi to the stage to begin our meeting. Thank you, Jacob, and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Held in Trust, a national convening, transforming cultural heritage conservation for a more resilient future. As Jacob mentioned, my name is Peter Trippi, and I'm president of the Foundation for Advancement and Conservation, or FAIC. More about our organization soon, but first, I want to say how delighted my fellow board members and I are to see so many of you here today in person and online. A bit of background, if I may. We are here today to mark a key moment in the life of Held in Trust, a four-year cooperative agreement between FAIC and the National Endowment for the Humanities. Held in Trust is part of NEH's A More Perfect Union initiative, about which we will hear more later. Held in Trust has three primary goals. Number one, to consider the current state, future directions, challenges, opportunities, and resource needs for the conservation and preservation of cultural heritage in the US, including movable objects such as art, artifacts, and decorative objects, and also archival materials, images, architecture, cultural sites, and intangible cultural heritage. Number two, to examine the intersection of cultural heritage conservation and preservation with issues of urgent importance in the world today. And finally, number three, to identify future directions and research resource priorities to ensure that our nation's cultural heritage will be available for future education and enrichment. Among today's many activities will be the highlighting of Held in Trust's five key findings. All of them underscore the fact that a vibrant and resilient future for conservation and preservation depends upon the development of new, highly collaborative paradigms and structures grounded in social justice, equity, and environmental action. This summer, FAIC and NEH will issue the full Held in Trust report, which will offer guidance for implementing these findings. Over the past four years, Held in Trust has brought together a broad range of conservation, preservation, and allied professionals, constituents, and communities. Many who contributed their expertise, energy, and time are with us today, and we thank you for your efforts. Others here today are esteemed colleagues from across the country. We appreciate your enthusiasm, and we look forward to collaborating with you in the future. We are particularly excited to meet and hear today's presenters, outstanding leaders from diverse conservation, community, and cultural organizations who will share evocative case studies that illustrate Held in Trust's key findings in action. The agenda for this afternoon's presentations appears in the brochure and the QR code you received upon arriving today. For those of you watching on YouTube, the agenda is in the email that you received containing the watch link. Before I introduce our first presenter, a brief word about the Foundation for Advancement and Conservation. Now celebrating its 50th anniversary, FAIC supports conservation education, research, and outreach activities that increase understanding of our global cultural heritage. Working closely with our sister organization, the American Institute for Conservation, our mission is to save cultural heritage for future generations, protecting it from decay and destruction. We advance research and education, lead treatment and collection care initiatives, and deploy conservation expertise to where it is most urgently needed. Our work empowers conservation professionals, strengthens cultural institutions, and engages stakeholders, including public audiences, as we work together to protect cultural heritage for humanity. I'm going to make a slight change to the program, and if you'll consult your agenda, we are going to hear from Chair Lowe first. Then we will hear from the Librarian of Congress. There's been a timing issue with traffic. <laughs> Washington, D.C., friends. Yes, I grew up here, I know. It is my very great honor and pleasure to introduce Shelley Lowe, Chair of the National Endowment for the Humanities. 
Chair Lowe's biography can be accessed via the QR code, but I will mention here that she is a citizen of the Navajo Nation and grew up on the Navajo Reservation in Ganado, Arizona. Before coming to NEH, she was a member of the National Council on the Humanities and held key posts at Harvard, Yale, and the University of Arizona. Please join me in welcoming Chair Lowe. Thank you so much, Peter, for the introduction and for opening us up today. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, this is an exciting day. I can't imagine how you feel today being here after all of the hard work that has happened over the past couple of years and to share everything that has come out of that. I'm really delighted to be here with all of you, and I hope that everybody is delighted to be here as well. Um, it's not just DC traffic, right? It's DC rain and traffic. <laughs> I want to thank Dr. Hayden, who was supposed to speak before me, for hosting us in, of course, the Library of Congress, this wonderful, beautiful building with so much history. And I want to thank her on behalf of the work that the library does in conservation, preservation, and the American people. Dr. Hayden is one of my favorite people. She throws the best parties. <laughs> You'll see later this afternoon. Um, well, My name is Shelley Lowe. I am Navajo. I am originally from Ganado, Arizona. I am chair of the National Endowment for the Humanities, and I live and work here, live and work here in Washington, D.C. As chair of the National Endowment for the Humanities, I am thrilled to see the work that Held in Trust has done and will continue to do. As many of you know, the seed for this project was planted back in 2017 with a very simple question. What would it take to move the field of conservation from surviving to thriving? NEH's founding legislation from 1965 calls for us to create a better understanding of the past, a better analysis of the present, and a better view of the future. Carrying out this mission requires reliance on physical objects. Letters, photographs, and diaries not only offer first-hand accounts of historical events, but the objects themselves tell stories. Garments that are worn and repaired and repaired again tell stories of hard journeys. Manuscripts with margin notes and revisions reveal a writer's creative process. Broken buildings and Plains Ledger art reflect the horrors of war. From the early days of NEH, agency leaders understood the power of objects and the need to preserve them. In its first decade of grant making, NEH was funding early microfilming efforts to preserve and create access to fragile records, as well as preservation of the physical materials. After the establishment of the Division of Preservation and Access in the early 1980s, NEH expanded grant making into direct support for conservation, including funding for graduate education in conservation, research into groundbreaking preservation methodology, establishment of regional conservation centers and networks, and ongoing disaster relief efforts, both nationally and abroad. NEH's longstanding preservation assistance grants program has allowed over 2,000 smaller cultural organizations to develop preservation plans and improve stewardship of their collections, including partnering directly with conservators for assessments. Despite the endowment's experience and investment in conservation, the question of what a thriving community of conservation and preservation professionals might look like persists. What are the challenges and opportunities facing the field at this moment in time? What investments of time, money, and expertise are required to move the field forward? How can conservators and preservation professionals work together to meet the moment? And perhaps most importantly, how can we individually and collectively help foster a society where all of humanity and their heritage is valued and thrives. Today, NEH is incredibly proud to stand here as a partner with FAIC as we attempt to answer some of these questions. The Held in Trust project and today's meeting 
is just the first step as the field identifies opportunities for reflection and growth. As you will hear throughout the afternoon, over the past three years, Held in Trust, the Held in Trust Steering Committee members, working group, conservators, and participants from allied professions have engaged deeply in critical areas of study, including environmental resilience, science and technology, inclusivity, equity, and collaboration in professional practice, education, philosophy, and ethics. And I wanna take a moment just to thank everybody for all of your hard work in this arena. This project directly supports our 250th commemorative commemoration work, A More Perfect Union. This initiative draws upon the insights of the humanities to help us connect the American future with the American past and cherish this inheritance for future generations by providing funding for humanities-based programs that foster a thriving democracy, expand opportunities and access for all Americans, and help us understand our relationship to the natural world. While Held in Trust seeks to explore a vision of what the future of conservation might look like, I'd like to take the next few minutes to explore why this work is so important, not just to the field, but to our collective humanity and our ability to tell and preserve not just objects, but the stories that tie us together. Joy Harjo, as many of you are probably very familiar, who is from the Muscogee Creek Nation and former U.S. Poet Laureate, one of the great parties Dr. Hayden hosted, was for Joy Harjo. <laughs> uh, she says in her poem, perhaps the world ends here, is that it's instructive for us all in thinking about the essential connection between an object and how it collects stories and meaning over time. She writes, the world begins at a kitchen table. No matter what, we must eat to live. The gifts of earth are brought and prepared, set on the table. So it has been since creation, and it will go on. It is here that children are given instructions on what it means to be human. We make men at it, we make women. At this table we gossip, recall enemies and ghosts of lovers. Our dreams drink coffee with us as they put their arms around our children. They laugh with us at our poor falling down selves, and as we put ourselves back together once again at this table. At this table we sing with joy, with sorrow. We pray of suffering and remorse. We give thanks. Perhaps the world will end at the kitchen table while we are laughing and crying, eating of the last sweet bite. I grew up on the Navajo Reservation in rural Northeast Arizona and the histories, traditions, and values that I carry with me were formed around the kitchen tables I sat at. Although I absorbed plenty of Navajo culture at church, at school, and in the community with family members all across my little town of Ganado, my cultural heritage was measured by the vastness of the Navajo landscape, as well as the beauty of the paintings and the woven rugs and the culture that was all around me every single day. The stories of creation, birth, death, and my own history are inseparable from the natural world. But what I can bring with me from Ganado to Cambridge, perhaps here to Washington, D.C., are objects, photographs, artwork, family mementos, jewelry, things that connect me with stories that make up my history and my humanity. In my previous position as executive director of the Harvard University Native American Program, we assisted with a welcoming event for a newly hired Anishinaabe faculty member named Shawan Kanu. The event included local tribal members and Native students, and Shawan's uncle flew in from Canada to give a traditional prayer and smudging ceremony. Now I have to say, this is a first for Harvard, so it was you know, a really big deal for a lot of us. We needed a few of the Anishinaabe tribal artifacts in the Peabody Museum at Harvard, specifically two items, a bowl and a ladle. Shawan knew these objects very well. She told the museum's curators that these had been crafted and endowed with the energy of everyone who had handled them so that they could be used. The story of this bowl and ladle was not a fixed one, and that by sitting in the archives, the museum was not allowing these items 
to fulfill their intended purpose. Shawan worked very closely with the museum staff to secure permission to use these objects in her event. And in the end, the museum staff brought the bowl and the ladle out from the museum in their special little white curator's gloves, packed in little white boxes with nice packaging foam all around it. And they very cautiously handed them over to Shawan, who did not have white gloves on. So she could use them in the traditional manner that they were meant. In the process of this event, we were reawakening the spirit, the spirit that these objects had been infused with, and in turn, allowed the full story of their history to be told. As some of you may know, and as I've described, it was really nerve wracking. It was, a, it was a tough experience, I think, for some of the museum curators and staff. But for Shawan and her uncle, and the native students who were in the, object, in the audience, the physical object was a connection to the past, to the present, and the future of our history. While the preservation of the bowl and the ladle is important, in that moment, it was something more. We were able to feed the spirit of each item and allow the, the story to continue to be told. I share this with you because the practice of conservation and preservation is about preserving and telling stories, which are the essence of the humanities. And the stories that objects can tell are not insignificant. They can make us feel seen for the first time, help us explore hard histories, and serve as a bridge and path forward through conflict. The connection between story and object is so significant that severing this connection or disassociation is considered equal to destruction from fire or flood when considering risk to cultural heritage. As Joy Harjo so well understands, the kitchen table bears witness. There is no story without the table and no table without the story. To give you another example of the power of stories, earlier this week, the Department of the Interior and NEH announced a new interagency partnership to expand the Federal Indian Boarding School Initiative through the collection of oral histories and the digitization of records documenting the experiences of survivors and descendants of Federal Indian Boarding School policies. We want to tell these important stories, stories of our nation, stories that would otherwise go untold. NEH has committed $4 million to support the digitization of records from the United States system of 408 federal Indian boarding schools and the creation of a permanent oral history collection documenting the experiences of generations of indigenous students who passed through the federal boarding school system. And that is just one of the many initiatives that we are starting to help tell this story. As we will hear today, the key findings that emerge from the Held and Trust Working Groups are not dissimilar to the challenges facing our nation today. Environmental justice, equity, community collaboration, and knowledge sharing are vital in our work and in our lives. But achieving these aims takes reflection, patience, understanding, and kindness. And that's where the power of an object and a story comes in. Like Harjo's table, Gathering around and sharing objects that we value and care about can help us in times of division because they remind us of what we all love, of what we all share. These objects are a bridge, allowing us to learn about others and ourselves. The history we encounter when we engage with these objects might make us uncomfortable. In fact, I think it often does. The phrase held in trust is a legal term that property is held and protected by a group of people or an organization on behalf of other people. As you will hear later, the work of cultural stewards must become more participatory and collaborative and move beyond working on behalf of other people to working with and for other people. In the interim, remember that what is held in trust is not just physical objects. It is the stories, the memories, the teachings, and indeed the entirety of a people's history and worldview that you hold. Recently, I attended a workshop at the Modern Language Association's annual conference where one of the indigenous presenters asked a question 
that resonates with the themes of today's gathering. Who are you doing this work for? And perhaps just as importantly, who are we leaving out? These are questions that I'm also asking staff at the NEH to reflect on, just as we are here. Who are we not reaching? What communities, what do communities need that they're not getting? How can the humanities build a bridge? In response to these questions, last year, NEH released an ambitious equity action plan to remove barriers to full and equal participation in the agency's programs and opportunities. NEH created an agency-wide equity task force focused on bolstering our data collection capacity, enhancing our outreach and branding for underserved communities, specifically tribal nations, veterans, historically black colleges and universities, Hispanic serving institutions, tribal colleges and universities, and community colleges, and simplifying NEH's grant application process. Taken together, these pillars put people at the center and they help us to see who we are reaching and how we can better engage with them. To that end, in November, we also announced our new American Tapestry Initiative. The full name is American Tapestry, weaving together past, present, and future, because that is exactly what it aims to do. It uses the humanities to address those most pressing challenges of our time, namely strengthening our democracy, advancing equity for all, and addressing our changing climate. With it, we are also launching a series of new grants aimed at those on the margins, those who wouldn't otherwise apply to NEH. Two of these programs can directly support cultural heritage organizations, like the new Climate Smart Humanities program that funds climate-focused strategic planning, and cultural and community resilience that supports community-based efforts to mitigate change, to mitigate climate change and COVID-19 pandemic impacts safeguard cultural resources, and foster cultural resilience through identifying, documenting, and or collecting cultural heritage and community experience. I share these examples with you to get you to think about how you might implement some of the findings of the Held in Trust, many of which overlapped with the work of NEH. I encourage you to engage in your community, learn new stories about your objects, both in your personal and professional life, Listen to those on the margins. How can we all better serve all Americans? And whose heritage do we hold in trust? Today, I want to invite you to imagine what tomorrow might look like. What can you do to create a sustainable, equitable, and thriving profession? The study and the work of Held in Trust exists in a world with many urgent challenges that we need to address. Systemic inequality, the effects on our, on our environment due to a changing climate and threats to democracy worldwide. Stepping up to face these challenges will take courage and the humanities force us to look at often very painful histories. But in return, the humanities give us the strength and courage, the knowledge of the past to help us move forward. Implementing the recommendations that come from the Held and Trust Steering Committee, Advisory Board and Working Groups will require the full investment of the, cons of the conservation community, government, private funders, and cultural heritage stewards throughout the United States. Already though, these groups have identified the climate crisis as the largest existential threat to collections and sites. Rising energy costs threaten financial stability, natural disasters threaten buildings, and climate-related diaspora threatens communities. And I'm going to give you a little bit of uh, uh, information ahead of time that you'll hear about later this afternoon. It's very exciting. When I became chair of NEH, I responded to, along with the staff, these urgent needs by providing $500,000 supplement to the Held and Trust team to rapidly develop resources to help cultural organizations identify climate-related threats to their sites, to their collections, and programming and work through basic planning efforts to increase resilience and sustainability. And I want to thank the Held and Trust for taking this on and for bringing this forward. 
While these resources cannot fully bridge the knowledge gap, I believe it is essential for NEH to take the lead in implementing the key findings of Held in Trust and supporting cultural institutions most impacted by climate change. I want to finally leave you with a line from another one of Joy Harjo's poems. It's called, For Calling the Spirit Back from Wandering the Earth in Its Human Feet. In it, she writes, the journey might take you a few hours, a day, a year, a few years, a hundred, a thousand, or even more. Held in Trust is a beginning, a small step toward a thriving conservation community. What are we preserving? What story are we telling? As I see it, we are at our best when we listen to each other, when we make room for all. At a moment when the humanities are called into question, it is our job to say these are stories that have value, stories that teach us and shape our lives. And it's not an either or, it's an and. Our ours is a shared future, and it starts with all of us working together. Thank you so much for all of your time, and thank you for the wonderful work that you are doing. Thank you very much, Chair Lowe. You've given us a great deal to consider and discuss throughout this afternoon. It is now my great honor and pleasure to introduce Dr. Carla Hayden, who was sworn in as the 14th Librarian of Congress in 2016. Dr. Hayden is the first woman and the first African American to lead our national library. Her biography can be accessed via the QR code, but I will mention here that before coming to the Library of Congress, she was the long-serving CEO of the Enoch Pratt Free Library in Baltimore. On behalf of everyone here, I would like to thank Dr. Hayden and her colleagues for making us all feel so welcome in this magnificent building today. Now please join me in welcoming Dr. Carla Hayden. Thank you, Peter, and good afternoon and welcome. Chair Lowe, thank you for honoring Joy Harjo, whose term as Poet Laureate has been glorious, and she stays with us in so many ways, so thank you for that. We are so pleased to host Held in Trust. Um, you may know that the mission of the Library of Congress is to, quote, engage, inspire, and inform Congress and the American people with the universal and enduring source of knowledge and creativity. Now many people, when they hear the word enduring, they think of preservation and conservation. However, our preservation efforts have a larger vision captured in the idea of universal and enduring because we believe that our history and our future I'm here. To everyone. <laughs> Now, we are in the Thomas Jefferson building, and sometimes he makes appearances, <laughs> and some of his relatives, and we can talk about that later. So you might hear some more things, especially if I mess up, so. Because the Library of Congress preserves our collective stories and ideas in every format that people have advised, even coming from beyond. So to succeed at that, the Library of Congress requires a preservation strategy that is just as diverse as our users and collections. And this national convening of the Held in Trust program is an important occasion to talk about the knowledge, skills, and insights of the conservators and how they can help us open up what we call the treasure chests of our collections that are in our care. The most important thing we can do to preserve our collections is to make sure people know about our collections and have a chance to have a relationship with them. That is what makes us want to keep things for the future. We rely on preservation first and foremost to make sure people have the opportunity to encounter an idea 
and we rely on preservation to find ways to make sure that that encounter is a first step on a path that will bring our collection safely into the future. Here at the Library of Congress, we welcome millions of people each year to experience our magnificent buildings, explore the collections we hold and trust, and engage with the services of our agency in person and online. Now, people do a lot of reading in the library, but they also need to hear and see and touch the objects in our care. Every year, our users surprise us with innovative ways to use the library's collections, and they give our conservators new and exciting challenges <laughs> as they do it. One is dear to my heart. Our conservators recently worked with our staff in the National Library for the Blind and Print Disabled to make sure our Braille music scores, the largest in the world, were properly housed. Preservation staff have worked with our music division to make sure our incredible collections of instruments are ready for use, from our Stradivarius violins to Gary Mulligan's saxophone, to a crystal flute you may have heard of recently. <laughs> Trust me that before James Madison's crystal flute was on stage with megastar Lizzo, it was in our scientific labs as part of a multi-year scientific study called Glass at Risk that we conducted with partners from Catholic University and George Washington University who were partially funded by our colleagues at NEH. And that research help us, helped us learn which flutes were safe to play and inform the care of gas, glass objects in the library and in museum collections nationwide. Now, there are hundreds of other examples I could pick from, but on my last, and as Jake Nadal will attest, frequent visits to the lab, I saw with members of Congress who were visiting Revolutionary War notebooks documenting how American forces handled British prisoners of war. John Woods, the first federal photographer's album. The Blackwell family tree, an oversized genealogical map that includes Arthur and Ashe's family going back to the 17th century. And we're gonna be putting that on display, it's wonderful a 15th century Korean loose metal type predating the printing of the Gutenberg Bible, and don't forget to see it when you're out there. That case, if anything happens, we joke that we all are gonna to try to get in that case <laughs> with the Bible. We will survive. <laughs> and an album with 19 fragments of historical balloons from the Tisselner collection on the history of aerodynamics including a piece of the first balloon to fly across the English Channel in 1785. Balloons are going around today, too. <laughs> but the common denominator across all of these items are, is the skillful, knowledgeable, and creative staff who work with those collections. And having staff like that is no accident. It reflects years of commitment and collaboration and is one of the reasons a convening like this is so important for our future. The Library of Congress has a great legacy of preservation. The library has played a role in national and international preservation efforts for many decades, and we are proud that we are continuing that, we think, with hosting held in trust. You may know that the library was created by an act of Congress in 1800 and that that collection was mostly lost to fire during the War of 1812. And it was replaced by Thomas Jefferson's library and then grew to the library we are today with more than 173 million items, making us the largest library in the world and the British library is close behind. <laughs> we go back and forth about what is an item. Is it the file and the 30 things in the file? Is it the file? So we, we back and forth. But in 1965, we worked the, with the Association of Research Libraries, ARL, to jointly sponsor a national preservation planning conference. 
and we continue to host symposiums and share our knowledge in conferences and publications and workshops. In 1967, we gathered preservation activities together to create the preservation directorate that you uh, know today and that Jake is the head of. In 2017, we expanded the scope of preservation to include collections management so that preservation staff have oversight of collections throughout their life, making sure they are properly stored and treated and then delivering them safely to our users. And in the decades between, we also created the National Audiovisual Conservation Center and established new programs to work on the challenges of preserving digital resources. We've engaged in partnerships like Chronicling America to preserve the history of newspapers in America, and now all 50 states are part of that. It just happened uh, that we got New Hampshire, the last state, <laughs> last state, well, they had to. Independent. <laughs> and we continue, though, to offer programs to train and educate budding conservators, including internships recognized by the American Institute for Conservation for over 40 years of excellence in supporting the professional development of conservators. And since receiving the, that award, we've worked to expand the reach of those opportunities and have hosted dozens of interns and fellows from underrepresented backgrounds and minority serving institutions to study preservation, conservation, and heritage science with our expert staff. And today, scientific analysis of materials coupled with insights from data science help us make better decisions on treatment and use of our collections. And it expands the kinds of research questions we can ask about the artifacts in our care. We recently expanded our staff to include an objects conservator to better care for our collections and make sure our growing exhibition program is conducted responsibly. Last year, our conservation division evaluated more than 400,000 items to make sure they were safe for their intended use. Maybe they needed to be camera ready for digitization in a frame for an exhibition or stabilized so a reader could safely turn the pages. And right now, preservation staff are engaged in an ambitious project to survey the entire general collection stacks. That's about 95,000 bookcases that hold about 17 million items, but they're ready. <laughs> Every month, thousands of items get their checkups from and go out to our users in the reading rooms and through interlibrary law. About two million people visit the Library of Congress every year in person here in Washington and quite a few to marvel this building to see our exhibits and participate in our programs and events. And today you're getting a special opportunity to be in this room which is usually by invitation only. And while we will have other new exhibits and orientation galleries, we will have a center for families and young people and a new welcome area and orientation area, and I get kind of excited about this, where people can view into the books, book stacks. One of the most frequent questions we get when people visit this library is, where are the books? So in the new orientation center, they will see just one aspect, but get a sense of the fact that the Library of Congress has 836 miles of shelving. So in a few years, very soon, the ground floor where you came in will be that open and inviting space that guides visitors through the timelines of the nation's history and the role of the Library of Congress in it. They will see Jefferson's Library that will be put into the new orientation center and they'll have a view of those book stacks that serve the reading rooms. Now, as we plan this, and I put ambitious project, see ambition twice, we were guided by the fundamental ethics of conservation and in consideration 
of the American Institute for Conservation's guidelines for ethical practice. And all of the changes are designed to have a light touch on the underlying architect architecture of this building. And very important, to be reversible. So we are removing a lot of mid-century drywall, the A word, asbestos, carpet and floor tiles. I had on here and I crossed it out because of this group, I said, and good riddance, but. <laughs> I figured you could understand. But all of the original materials that are being removed are also being retained. And all of the new installations are planned as removable elements that do not impact the underlying structures. We have needed to change how we use this building, the iconic Thomas Jefferson Building, 1897, the first federal building to have electricity. So as you notice, a lot of the light fixtures feature light bulbs because they were so proud and globes over the past century. And we are in a building that is for us like the Stradivarius violins. They are living instruments, our buildings. And the way we preserve them is guided by our goal to have them play a role in the lives of generations to come. This masterpiece of American architecture is a powerful instrument to engage, inspire, and inform our users, and we want to share it. I want to conclude by thanking the Heldon Trust team for conducting their valuable work and for planning this gathering today. It is an honor and a pleasure to hold this event at the Library of Congress and to see so many of our friends and colleagues and collaborators assembled for the purpose. We are fortunate at the Library of Congress to have an exceptional team of conservators and preservation staff who are committed to the same principles of equity, inclusion, collaboration, and sustainability that guide held in trust. Those are the values that matter throughout this institution, institution and with so many of you. So thank you again for your support and attendance. Make sure you look at the light bulbs. <laughs>
And in that spirit of optimism, together, we are all committed to building a future that is inclusive and collaborative, sustainable and resilient. Together, we agree that climate action is critical for all of us, and we welcome all to work with us in constructive ways, in protecting our cultural heritage and protecting the planet. We can do this together. This Held in Trust national convening is important. It's an important call to action for all of us involved in cultural heritage, preservation, and conservation. And today's convening brings together each of us to further shape collaborative paradigms and structures that are grounded in social justice, equity, inclusion, which we've heard. Some of our speakers here represent those who have worked directly in the Held in Trust project since 2017. And there are many of us uh, today on the stage who are also here as exemplars in our field. They are already leading the necessary transformative conservation and preservation work that we must do together and collaboratively. All are here to inspire, challenge, and move our field forward and to call on those in the public and private sectors to commit further to this work and to support us. We need more public-private partnerships. The Full Held and Trust report will build out the key findings mentioned, providing direction to accelerative posit positive changes in our field, like our culture at large is undergoing such profound and necessary transformations today. We're most appreciative to all of you here and all of you that have served on the Held and Trust steering and working groups, the FEAC staff, the AIC staff and boards, and with much gratitude to FEAC President Peter Trippi, uh, Peter, thank you so very much for your leadership and for your service on the board for the past 10 years. And to the future, which is happening as we speak through FAIC's Climate Resilience Resource Project team who are here today, uh, thank you so very much. I thank each of you. This is just the beginning, as Chair Lowe said, and you'll hear throughout today. Our work must continue, and I thank each of you once again. And I thank those of you that are watching this program in advance for the work that we'll embark on together, working on transforming our cultural heritage for a more resilient future. And to those of you who will join us with the NEH supporting this work, our sincerest thanks, because we just can't do this without you. We could not have gotten this far without FAAC's outreach manager, Caitlin Lee. Thank you so very much. and our Held and Trust Project Coordinator, Pamela Hatchfield. And now it's my honor and pleasure to introduce Pam. Pamela Hatchfield is the Coordinator of Held and Trust and the Head of Objects Conservation Emerita of the Museum of Fine Arts Boston. She is a Fellow of the American Institute for Conservation, the International Institute for Conservation, and the American Academy in Rome. And Pam, as you know, is a past president of AIC and FAIC. So please welcome Pam. Wow. It's hard to believe this moment is actually here. I was saying earlier to a few people that in the pandemic, in the middle of everything, every single day was just completely the same. And we went from little square Zoom meeting to little square Zoom meeting to little square Zoom meeting, and all of a sudden, boom, here we are. And a lot has been accomplished. Um, so I'm really thrilled to be here today and thank all of you for being here, for being online, and also for being in the beautiful members room. Bet you didn't think you'd see baby pictures today, did you? <laughs> this is my son when he was about 10 months old. And around that time, I was incredibly lucky to attend a seminar with the eminent pediatrician T. Barry Brazelton. And he said something to me that day that was incredibly helpful, not just in parenting, but also in my career and in life in general. He said, before every period of great advancement, you will see a period of great disorganization, regression, and chaos. But rest assured, progress, advancement, and even transformation are on their way. I can't tell you how helpful that's been to me, especially over the past number of years. Certainly, we've seen that the past number of years have been a period of great regression, uh, chaos, and disorganization. But today, we can also see signs of progress, advancement, and even transformation. 
We're at an inflection point where it's clear that evolutionary change is needed and already is producing profound alterations in the way we think, the way we work, and the way we live. The idea for Held in Trust, as a couple of people have already said, was born in 2017 in conversations between the NEH and FAIC, before the pandemic, before the murders of Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, and George Floyd, and before it seemed like the world really was on fire. But these and many other murders and confrontations ignited national reckonings on racism, inclusivity, equality, and equity, which required and continue to require that we look inward and take stock of where we are and how we navigate in the world. Acknowledgement of injustices and efforts to rectify them have been painfully slow. Just to give a few very small examples in the area of cultural heritage, I'll mention NAGPRA, which probably all of you know, enacted in 1990, which recognized that the disposition of human remains, funerary objects, sacred objects, and objects of cultural patrimony should be dictated by their lineal descendants. Just another example, 1999, the Burra Charter in Australia articulated the importance and primacy of multiple perspectives led by First Nation communities. And then also, and very importantly in the US, um, new ways of working together were developed over a period of years in New Mexico by the School for Advanced Research at the Indian Arts Research Center. And these produced the guidelines for collaboration between collections, conservators, and tribal communities in caring for their cultural heritage. And I know that Brian Vio is here today somewhere, maybe in the other room, uh, who was instrumental in these, informing these guidelines, as was Landis Smith, one of our steering committee members. And AIC, even AIC, in 2010 and 2011, um, worked on a volume on ethics and critical thinking about the practice of conservation. These appeared in talks and presentations in two of our annual meetings. I just want to quote from the volume produced from these papers. Lately, having witnessed dramatic reordering of priorities and new challenges, a vigorous examination of the underlying assumptions guiding our practice seemed appropriate. We considered whether the core values of conservation still hold true and whether they can still be exercised and upheld in light of the challenges of environmental and economic sustainability, the realities of today. So the things we care about, the artifacts of our lives, the places, the monuments, have many different stories and histories living within them. And we've already heard quite a lot about this and we'll hear more because this is kind of the crux of what we're talking about. But what happens to the meaning inherent in our things, our places, when they're lost, destroyed, taken away, excluded, or removed? We know that many assumptions, colonialist, elitist, racist, etc., on which our profession was established no longer hold. This project challenges those assumptions and requires us to rethink whose cultural heritage this is, who gets to use it, who gets to preserve it, and how, what stories and histories are told, by whom, and how. I've just screwed myself up here. <laughs> um, so the close collaboration between the NEH and FAIC is so meaningful precisely because it centers the humanness of what we do. It places our work clearly in a community and requires new perspectives and new paradigms, and you'll hear those words over and over again. Many of you present today, either in these rooms or virtually, have been at the forefront of these discussions and are already promoters and initiators of the transformative change in the fields of preservation and conservation. I counted this up last week. More than 150 people worked on this project, deeply on this project, including our amazing steering committee and working groups, our advisory council, and others who offered their wisdom and insight. And I want to acknowledge the purposeful and dedicated work of the FAIC team and our NEH partners with whom we developed this project. You'll hear some of them speak today, and you've already heard Chair Lowe speak today. I particularly want to extend my gratitude to the tireless and brilliant Kate Lee and our, yes. <laughs> And our, our wonderful editor, Leslie Kennedy, I don't know if she's in this room or the other, but she was going to be here, and I want to give her a huge round of applause. Also. 
she's amazing, and you will get to see how amazing she is first when you look at our um, summaries, which are now online, and then later in the summer, our final reports. We owe also our profound thanks to all of you who identified the primary issues, examined and explored them, defined them, gave voice to them, and joined together to create Held in Trust. So thank you all so much. So we're getting an idea of what Held in Trust is. Over the past three or four years, we've taken a broad look at where the field has come from, where we are today, and what our future must look like. We identified needs, priorities, and directions. We looked at the state of our field's infrastructure, the effects of changing climate on the preservation of cultural heritage, and our practices in conservation and preservation. We examined and took stock of serious barriers to diversity and equity in conservation, preservation, and preventive conservation. What were the key challenges related to technology and science? How about the challenges related to digital and multimedia preservation? Environmental sustainability, funding sustainability, human sustainability. Some clear themes which you see here have emerged from this work. The interconnectedness of conservation and preservation with climate, the environment and world we live in, culture, our values, community, who this work is for, and collaboration, how we do this work and with whom is clear. Held in Trust focuses on how conservation and preservation interact with the pressing issues we face today. All of these elements are inextricably tied together in our work to transform cultural heritage for a more resilient future. And this really uh, is the essential message of Held in Trust. You heard Peter say this. You'll hear me say it again in a second because I think it really says what we're all about. Um, and you'll hear parts of this throughout all of our work. A vibrant and resilient future for conservation and preservation depends upon the development of new, highly collaborative paradigms and structures grounded in social justice, equity, and environmental action. Throughout this process, we have been working with Michelle kumi Bear, a social justice and anti-racism consultant. She helped us examine and refine our thinking and our language as we developed our perspective and our documents. She observed, observed that, and I'm going to quote briefly from her report to us, one of her reports to us. Collectively, our reports read as a call for a title shift in worldviews and philosophical approaches that pervade the cultural heritage preservation field from more Western Euro Eurocentric approaches to more indigenous approaches from people of the global majority. She also said, collaboration is a core theme across working groups and there's an opportunity to address how power, culture, and ideology operate to support or hinder collaboration in the field. And the third major point I wanted to mention today was that capacity for equity practice in the field is lacking. So these observations appear throughout the work we did and are reflected in the strategic goals and initiatives that you'll see in our final reports. Further detail and summaries, as I just said, of the findings of the work can be found via the QR code in your program or the URL in the video description or by going to our website. And there'll be lots more uh, information available soon. The final reports will be out pretty soon in the summer with specific recommendations for action. And we will be sure to let everyone know when those are ready. So just to give you a sneak preview of the kind of work that we're doing and what this work is going to look like in the final reports, um, I give one small example from digital research and practice. Um, each group identified three primary areas of focus and identified related goals, strategies, and timeframes. And this is just a very brief snapshot from one of those. Um, goal number one for digital research and practice define and communicate frameworks, standards, and benchmarks to guide the preservation of technology-based cultural heritage. The short-term goals they identified included three components. Identify a host for centralized online resources for digital preservation. To maximize visibility, this would ideally be a high-profile federal agency, such as the Library of Congress. <laughs> Just saying. Initiate, number two, initiate development of consolidated resource for digital preservation knowledge that encompasses the diversity of disciplines, 
collections and internal capacities. And their third short-term goal was to secure multi-year grant funding for the development of centralized resources and advocate for agencies to increase funding for analog audiovisual preservation. Then midterm goals included funding for audiovisual preservation being increased and continuing and a stable and affordable cooperative data storage and digi digital preservation program being established. And then finally in the long term in our perfect world, the cooperative data storage and digital preservation program is stable and operating smoothly. Sounds good, doesn't it? So, across our original nine areas of study, the devastating effects of extreme weather brought on by climate change surfaced in many ways. It became clear that without, without attempting to address the effects of climate change on cultural heritage, the other findings and recommendations of held in trust would be muted at best. We know that climate change poses an existential threat. Cultural resources continue to sustain significant damage from climate change induced events and our working group members, all of them, voiced the need for resilience building information. Immediate action was required to provide unified resources targeted to cultural heritage entities so that they might be able to understand the type and level of risks their particular location faces, provide learning materials and spe specific examples of how this work might be accomplished. It became clear that this work was essential to Held in Trust's mission. So while Held in Trust was still in its initial stages, we applied once more to the NEH for a supplemental project to develop climate resilience resources for cultural heritage institutions. And um, Shelley let me know that she was going to be doing a spoiler alert, but I was going to say, you've got to stay tuned for the afternoon so that you can see how this all turned out. But as you know, they gave us about half a million dollars to continue this. There'll be more information about this in the afternoon after the coffee break. Now I want to mention briefly the lovely green notebook that I hope most of you, the in-person attendees, received with their program. We've tried to limit printed materials and both this and the program are recycled. We hope you'll find yourselves writing in this notebook as our speakers share their thoughts and projects with you. Those in person might detect a slight odor as they write because it's made entirely from apples. And again, please use the QR code on the program or the URL on YouTube to find more information related to the project. Summaries of the working group findings are posted there and the full reports later this summer. Now I want to speak to the speakers. This is the really exciting part of the program today. The speakers who are joining us today come from very different parts of our cult cultural heritage community with a wide range of experience and expertise. But what they hold in common is this. First, they each represent an essential component of our original areas of study. Second, and most importantly, they represent the future of preservation and conservation. They have identified a need in the field and set about articulating it, filling it, and getting it funded. We hope you'll be energized and inspired by them as you see how they are transforming conservation and preservation in the United States today. We've provided their biographies, uh, more detailed biographies on our website. And again, you can access them through the QR code or the URL. But because our time today is so limited, we want you to hear from them, not about them. And I am so thrilled and appreciative and honored that they have all agreed to work with us and join us today. It is now my pleasure to bring to the podium Neil Barkley, our first speaker. Thank you. I'm not sure if it's a blessing or a curse to be first. <laughs> You're either compared to everyone else or, no, I'm not going to be. Uh, <laughs> I did want to say, though, that uh, my presentation doesn't deal a lot with optics or conservation, as it turns out. But the context in which all of this work should be considered in terms of what is happening with our planet and climate change, and particularly the role of African-Americans and black and brown people 
in the environmental movement, the environmental equity movement, and how that provides a context for all of us to engage a wider community of individuals um, in this work. So thank you for inviting me to speak to you today. I consider it to be a great privilege to be leading the Wright Museum at this critical time in our nation's history. I'm truly grateful to have the opportunity to talk to you about the work that the Charles H. Wright Museum is doing as it relates to climate change and sustainability and environmental equity in the museum sector. You will hear uh, outstanding presentations this afternoon from my colleagues specifically about their conservation practices but I have chosen to focus on the broader issue of environmental equity and justice as it relates to the present moment of climate disruptions facing our world and the historic role of African Americans in those conversations. My goal is to allow us to think more broadly about the history of environmental acti activism in this country and the specific contributions of people of African descent to those ongoing conversations. Our work at the right illustrates the beginning of a conversation with the communities we serve. These conversations attempt to enlighten and empower our community to continue to uncover innovative ways to address what is a growing crisis for all of us, including how we preserve the critical objects that hold our cultural heritage. Uh, where's my ticker here? Where do I click here? Click. That's my name. Here I am. <laughs> Easy, right? Uh, so our mission at the right is to open minds and change lives through the exploration and celebration of African American history and culture. So as a director of one of the nation's largest encyclopedic museums of black culture, I am frequently asked why the right finds it increasingly involved in sustainability work. To me, this illustrates yet another largely ignored aspect of our nation's history as it relates to the profound contributions of people of African descent. To my mind, the question reveals how little is known about the destructive effects of our environmental policies have had on black and brown people around the globe. And in many ways, as our nation has focused its attention on the deleterious effects of climate change on our natural environment, we have left largely unexamined how these changes have negatively affected the neighborhoods and loved ones who are the most vulnerable among us. This question also explores how little is known about African Americans' historic role in environmental movement and preservation, and how black and brown communities have a legacy of addressing these concerns in a variety of ways that continue to inform our mutual understanding of the phenomenon now called climate change. As, we, uh, as the right, we strive for an excellence in everything we do. Like many, our institution operates according to a strategic plan. We outline five specific goals. Some of them are centering uh, the vibrant community that is Detroit in our work, achieving financial stability, mentoring the next generation of museum leaders, and all that might seem obvious, right? However, it's our focus on sustainability that most surprises those encountering our goals for the first time. If, like us, however, you are committed to sustainability, conservation practices, environmental justice, or eradicating the effects of climate change, you must make it known and hold yourself to do something to address these issues as part of your everyday museum practice. Mm -hmm. uh, slides are in a different order, so I'm gonna go back and forth, I think. All right, I'm going to ignore my slides. How about that? <laughs> I don't know how many of you make these kinds of speeches, but by the time you get to the podium, they're totally different order <laughs> than what you first thought, how you first thought you were going to say it. But what I wanted to talk about is the fact that this issue is so hard to ignore in the African American community. Uh, I have a slide that looks at. Um, uh, it has two bottles. One is the water in Flint, and the second is the water in Detroit, that same period of time. And look at the difference in those two things, right? Uh, so climate worsens air pollution, it exacerbates inequities, and so the right utilizes history to better understand much what are these most pressing issues. Our colleagues at the Detroit Historical Society use a phrase that captures this idea 
that our institutions are places where the past is always present, right? When one considers the devastating effects of the Flint water crisis, which is still being felt today, as my grandmother might say, just down the road a piece <laughs> from our facility, the past is present indeed in our communities. And for African Americans, this has become a personal issue, right? As frankly, it should be for all of us. So African American communities are more vulnerable to severe weather and floods. More than half of African Americans in the United States live in the South, an area that is and will continue to see stronger hurricanes and increased flooding from climate change. Climate change makes air pollution worse, and this will exacerbate significant inequities already being experienced in African American communities and other communities of color. A recent study found that African Americans breathe in 56% more particulate matter than they produce from their consumption. Climate change is already increasing the frequency of heat waves, uh, a trend that is projected to increase as greenhouse gas emissions continue to rise. Counties with large African American populations are already exposed to extreme temperatures two to three more days per year than those counties with smaller African American populations. By mid-century, these county, counties are projected to experience about 20, 20 more extreme heat days per year. This is especially troubling, as a study in California found that during the last heat wave, African Americans were twice as likely to die compared to other groups. So given this reality, it uh, should come as no one's surprise <laughs> that African American history is actually replete with examples of how black and brown people have been fighting for environmental justice for decades. From sparking the modern environmental justice movement to conducting key research on environmental pollution to founding countless grassroots organizations, we've been deeply involved in this work. Our legacy is really undeniable. So allow me to introduce you just a few examples of our pioneering ancestors. The first of which is Solomon Brown. He was the first African-American employee of the Smithsonian Institution, educated himself on natural history, and was the source of many of the illustrative maps and specimens that were available during his lifetime. He also wrote poetry, and is remembered to this day on the grounds of the National Museum, just near us here, of natural history here in DC, where several trees were planted in his honor. George Washington Carver was an agricultural researcher. He's mostly known today for promoting the ubiquitous peanut, which helped replenish the soil in the impoverished South. In his master's thesis dated 1894, he wrote that man must take the initiative in using nature to provide sustainable food systems that will help alleviate hunger, encourage local participation and activism, and to safeguard and control our local food and water systems. Two more. Um, Wangari Matai, who some of you may know, was a Kenyan scholar, an international recognized environmental and human rights activist. In 1977, she found the Green Belt movement, Belt movement, which introduced the idea of planting trees to help conserve the environment. However, the Green Belt movement did more, and I think this is important than plant trees. They work to this day with local communities to hire women's groups to plant the trees, right? In an effort to not only improve the local um, environment, but improve the everyday lives of people living in it. So this is a great example of how we take these principles, right, and we go a step further with them. We embed them in our work in a way that has additional uh, um, effects within our community. So it's an approach to sustainability that has been incredibly successful with over 53, 51 million trees, if you can imagine, planted today. My favorite is that, um, the famous plant wa Planet Walker. <laughs> After witnessing an oil spill in San Francisco Bay, Dr. John Francis chose to travel to the United States for 22 years without the use of motorized vehicles to raise awareness for the needs of our environment. He spent most of the time walking. He also spent 17 years not speaking, but cultivating his listening skills. He believed that the way we treat each other 
is a mechanism for how we treat the earth. And so John Francis became the National Geographic Society's first education fellow in 2010. So let's get to the, uh, our own work here at the right. What we are doing is integrating environmental concerns into our exhibition and programmatic design practices. And so our work is centered, see if we can find it. There it is, wow, um, <laughs> uh, in three areas. It's centered on water, energy, and greening. But again, we do this within the context of our uh, museum work. So, and I need to make this a little bit larger for myself because I'm almost blind. One second here, so I can talk about this a little bit better. Uh -oh. One second, one second. Okay. All right, that's just for me. So, uh, making the invisible visible. So on our physical plant at the right, uh, we have um, some flooding, we've had some flooding issues in Detroit and um, throughout the region and our front door actually has been uh, susceptible to floods. So what we've done is we've installed pavers, right? Um, to capture the groundwater and to prevent flooding in that area. However, the design of the pavers actually references a historic um, African symbol. Um, the Sankofa symbol, which is about how one looks back, right, to understand the, the, the moment they're in now and the future, right? So this is now at the front door of our institution. It's a water conservation device, right? But it ties back in to the history that we are promoting, right? Um, we work also with um, water, day, water and Earth Day at the museum. But we bring in communities from throughout Southeast Michigan to our facility to talk about these issues within the context of art and creative, uh, making creative devices. And then we work with our, our students and education programs and embedding this work into um, our, our everyday practice. Um, we work on energy and behavior change. Of course, we're tracking more and more our data consumption, things like that. Um, but we're also looking at how energy can be used in creative ways. So for example, we have, most recently we had, I was talking about it at lunch, um, we did a concert that was, um, the, the electric for it was done with solar power, right? And not only was it done with solar power, but then it was projected into four different neighborhoods. So we erected screens and that solar power projected this music into four community parks. Again, using an environmental device, but to do something that really connects to the culture uh, where, where we were. We do a number of festivals. Um, I love the fact that some of our artists are now painting the dumpsters in Detroit with art, <laughs> so that people know to the recycling dumpsters are now quite beautiful in Detroit, <laughs> thanks to these artists, right? But we're also, um, you know, adding recycling and those kinds of things in places where you normally would not have seen them. The African World Festival in Detroit is one of the largest festivals in Southeast Michigan and in the Midwest. And so this notion of adding this kind of recycling presence, and it's very obvious that that's happening to that festival really does gather people's attention. Um, we talked about the Sankofa. You see, let's see if I can get it here. Building infrastructure. These, this is a, the second picture is an example of that projected solar screen uh, that we had with someone sitting in the park watching it on a thing we erected from recycled materials. Um, the picture on the right is a picture where some of the trees on our plant were dying, right? And so instead of just letting them die, we, um, uh, mulch, we, we took the wood from them and working with the College of Creative Studies, we're able to have them build objects from the wood, which became part of their, uh, seeing their um, exhibits uh, the coming that, that year. I can tell you all about the impacts, the outcomes, and the et cetera of all this work. You can see that the energy utilization is not as close as we would be, want it to be to the national medium, but we're tracking it, right? We're trying to understand what that means for us. Um, I wanted to just say, this is an interesting slide that my 
my um, staff always reminds me of about museums in general, why this work can have more impact within the context of a museum, right? And it's because with all of the, how could I describe it, where, uh, where people get information, what they believe, what they don't believe, museums are actually now considered one of the most trustworthy sources of information, right? An interesting statistic. Uh, this is a study that they did back in 2008. Um, so, that's my. So one way to lift up our sustainable commitments, our conservation commitments, is to be intentional about the ways in which we develop our physical plants, our programs, with an eye towards sustainability practices that are embedded on our work. A solar power concert, an art exhibit with objects made from dying trees, programs for children that can involve them in gardening and learning how to conserve the earth and the soil and find the best light for their, for their work, for these works. So what does this mean for each of you? Right? You're conservationists, you're protectors of objects. It seems to me that speaking more broadly as repositories of history, and this is what we do, right? What we're trying to do is to seek to deepen one's understanding of each other and the challenges and, and opportunities of all areas of American life. As museum professionals, I believe that we must redouble our efforts to expand that conversation using the history of some of the communities that we serve who is so readily available to us about these issues and, and to use those as a, as a door into some of this work. Such an approach requires us to address issues of climate change or conservation from a multifaceted vantage point. We are truly to understand and appreciate the complexity of what we challenge and how appropriate the solutions that we might come up with are for all of us. It also underscores how each of us has a role to play in crafting the solutions we might identify moving forward in ways that would serve to benefit us all. And lastly, I will say to you, let's get at it. Let's do it. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Anisha Gupta. I'm a paper and preventive conservator. I'm former uh, AIC co-chair of the Equity and Inclusion Committee, and I recently returned to pursue a PhD at the University of Delaware. I'm delighted to be moderating this panel of conservation professionals today. So with the time that we have, I'm going to spend a few minutes introducing some of the topics that came up as we prepared for the panel. Then each of the panelists is going to come up, spend a few minutes introducing their work and their background, and then we're going to gather and talk about some of the common threads that have come up in our work together. So I was drawn to conservation for some of the same reasons as many of you in the field the exclusive access to priceless cultural heritage and helping others to have those experiences with art and artifacts. I was trained not to use conservation as a roadblock and say no to new ideas, but I wasn't always trained on how to say yes. That's something that's motivated me to do the work that I do, thinking about breaking down barriers of access, and it's why I'm researching questions of access and power in my doctoral research. These are also some of the same questions that are motivating our panelists today. They're doing incredible work and putting so much effort into the projects that are centered on creating access to conservation and reaching communities beyond the usual boundaries of our field. So that got me really thinking, why? Why do they have to do this work? Why do they have to work so hard? And even as we think about the title of today's program, transforming cultural heritage conservation, 
why do we need to transform? So I'd like to take a step back and try to think about some of the answers to those questions. Over the last 30 years or so, conservation has been trying to shift towards a more people-centered approach. Uh, techniques that incorporate stakeholders or people um, in communities that are outside of our institutions, centering people's needs over the object's material. Through our collaborations with indigenous communities and contemporary artists, we have really started to fundamentally shift some of our practices. This could include traditional care techniques from indigenous communities and allowing for the deterioration of materials. And even since the early 1990s, we've had sustained internship and outreach programs, which introduce underrepresented students to the field with the hope that they'll enter graduate programs and racially diversify the field. There really has been genuine concern and care for this issue and a sustained effort in the field. But despite these shifts and an ongoing focus on representation, representation hasn't changed in the last 30 years. You can see the statistics here of the field about 30 years ago in 1993 and about today, where our demographics are largely the same. The stats show that we haven't shifted who does the work, especially when compared with the US statistics overall, which have changed significantly over the last 30 years. Our field doesn't reflect that. I believe that these issues of power, access, and representation are ones that we have to tackle in order to see the change that we want to see. We've been focused on how the field looks, but we need to look at how the field functions. If our systems don't change, if we don't change our mindset and how we approach our work, if we don't stop relying only on outreach programs to bring underrepresented students into a field that wasn't designed for them, we won't have more of the inspiring stories you're about to hear because we won't be part of this field. All of us on this panel are black, indigenous, or people of color, the acronym BIPOC. Because the retention of BIPOC workers is so low in museums and libraries, there's a good chance that in 10 years, some of us won't still be part of this field. As a former co-chair of the Equity and Inclusion Committee, I know that these are tough problems to tackle, but I also know that we received widespread support and positive feedback from the membership. Conservation needs to change, and conservation is ready to change, which is why our panelists are taking creative new approaches, rewriting the rules, and expanding our idea of what conservation is and who is a conservator. They give us a glimpse into what systemic change can look like. And if all of us to listening today support them and their ideas, or are inspired to start our own new projects, we can really grow in exciting new directions. So with that introduction, I am so delighted to introduce you to today's panelists. Hector Berdicia Hernandez is the Director General of CENCOR, a new uh, regional center in Puerto Rico. Dr. Alicia Magici is Associate Scientist for the Network Initiative of Conservation Science at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Mariah Olinskis is an audiovisual archivist, a PhD candidate at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and a founding member of the Community Archiving Workshop, which is a project she'll be sharing with us today. And Cheyenne Carraway is Choctaw and Chickasaw from Southern Oklahoma, and a current graduate student at the UCLA Getty Conservation of Cultural Heritage Program. So to start us off, I'd like to invite Hector to the stage uh, to share his work with you. Thank you. Thank you, Anisha. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here today. Um, my name is Hector Verdecia Hernandez, and I currently serve as the Director General of the Centro de Conservación y Restauración de Puerto Rico. Our cultural heritage from buildings through collections comes in many sizes and shapes and reside in diverse and complex environmental and social cultural contexts. These challenges require creativity, while simultaneously pushes conservation practitioners to embrace innovative practices to meet the needs of cultural heritage in diverse settings. The lack of access to technical preservation and conservation expertise, educational opportunities, and economic resources are some of the, um, of the most pressing challenges in underserved communities, especially in the Caribbean region. 
Conservation practitioners and stewards in regions with scarce resources often face questions about advancing the conservation field, particularly when established principles, methodologies, and standard practices in our field come almost entirely from the global north. There has been a need to rethink or at least deal with these complex contextual challenges collaboratively with communities locally and regionally. This brief presentation discusses lessons and approaches from our experience developing a long-term sustainable strategy to promote technical expertise, education, and research in heritage preservation tailored to Puerto Rico's needs. When discussing a specific context and challenges for Puerto Rico and the Caribbean region, we must acknowledge two particular factors. First, the environmental and climate. Second, the socio-economic and educational challenges. When we talk about the environmental and climate conditions, we need to consider the tropical climate. We know the tropics is not a stable environment as climate in the, tem in the template regions. We also need to consider climate change, which is affecting Caribbean communities more than other parts of the world. And we have to consider also natural disasters as they keep growing every year. When considering also socioeconomic context, these issues are usually linked to research, training, and practice of the discipline. There is a lack of, of economic resources for conservation work. There is a lack in Puerto Rico of updated policy tools we have to consider also the political context, language barriers, and the U.S. colonial relationship with Puerto Rico. We have to consider also the lack of technical expertise and services. And particularly in Puerto Rico, we don't have formal academic training or professional degree programs in conservation and no or few professional development opportunities. Also, we have to consider lack of research and gaps in access to information and research papers. And lastly, we need to consider the inadequate management, which is a result of all these issues. Because conservation work is, in Puerto Rico and our communities, too costly or difficult. Our projects are driven by last-minute considerations rather than a planned approach or a good decision-making process. The current needs and natural disasters, including Hurricane Maria and Irma, have led to the foundation of the Centro de Conservación y Restauración de Puerto Rico as a new nonprofit regional conservation center to serve the Puerto Rico and Caribbean region in late 2020. The center was founded considering these complex challenges while attempting to solve or at least deal with them collaboratively. The lessons learned from that process has led off to think and envision a development of an adaptive approach to advance the conservation practice in Puerto Rico through the Conservation Center. We have first to consider our needs. We started prioritizing getting the information and data to guide our decision-making process. We have to consider also diverse existing models and define our scope of work. And this reflected, this helped to select or and tailor a model that can be appropriate and financially sustainable long-term. We also started thinking about fostering small, impactful projects and how to do that, do less with more. Also, we seek to transform any project into an opportunity to create outreach and educate, focusing on building capacity, training, and professional development opportunities. Also, we have to, we have to think about adapting traditional methodologies and practices or building new ones. The context pushes us to do more with less, often fostering low-cost, common-sense practices. We also envision, and we're actively doing, collaborations and partnerships locally, regionally, and nationally. And lastly, we have to think about our audiences. We needed an educational content the need to appeal to the public to promote first awareness of our heritage and then how to start preserving and conserving it. As a sample of our current work, Sencor has developed over 40 projects in almost three years, prioritizing research, education, capacity building, and technical expertise on heritage preservation. 
We are currently leading the conversation with some of our projects, including the Climate Resilience Resources for Cultural Institutions, which is a project from FAIC and NEH that we will hear more later in the afternoon, uh, which is coordinated regionally by our center. And finally, last week, we launched Papel Se Conserva, a multi-annual long-term initiative for the conservation of heritage on paper, books, and photographic materials in Puerto Rico. Since the beginning of our journey, I have kept asking how others in the past have done it. As we start small, the center will adapt at its growth, as often conservation projects do. In the end, we are building a hub to advance the practice and promote the preservation of our cultural heritage locally and regionally. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. As Anisha already mentioned, my name is Alicia McGeechee, and I'm an associate research scientist with the Network Initiative for Conservation Science at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. I began my scientific career in an NSF-funded center for chemical innovation, so I've often found myself working in collaborative research models that adopt diffuse and decentralized structures for the sustainable distrib such, uh, distribution of resources and expertise. I continue to build on these ex experiences first with the Center for Scientific Studies in the Arts and now with NICS to democratize and amplify access to science and unlock hidden and untold stories from culturally and artistically significant objects. NICS and the Center for Scientific Studies in the Arts, which is a joint research initiative between Northwestern University and the Art Institute of Chicago, share similar programmatic in in infrastructures where in institutions typically without their own scientific instrumentation, scientists or occasionally even conservators, submit research proposals to facilitate the conservation and preservation of objects, support exhibition objectives, or other materials-based uh, art historical queries. For some of our collaborators, these exchanges may represent the first time that science is being actively integrated into the museum practice. And when needed, we work closely with them to identify and develop comprehensive research projects that can support them meeting their institutional priorities. With the increasing portability of some of the scientific equipment that we need to address the questions of our collaborators, we are quickly able to jump into a car and bring our labs to them or collect samples for analysis at our home institutions for further insights. Our services are provided free of charge to the user, thereby removing the financial barrier that might otherwise prohibit the technical study of objects in the collections of institutions that are underfunded or undersupported. As another field-wide benefit, these models also serve as important opportunities for training the next generation of technical conservators and scientists, which is critically valuable, particularly in the United States, where uh, technical and formal training opportunities for conservation scientists are still in their nascency. If you're interested in any of the stories I'm gonna to share today or how two people were able to carry 400 pounds of equipment in the back of a family van, you can find me during the coffee break, okay? Uh, to illustrate how these research projects can crystallize into meaningful exchanges, I will briefly highlight a series of projects exploring the influence of Spanish colonialism on the evolution, transference, and endurance of artistic practices across the Americas and the Caribbean. An early project with the Center for Scientific Studies in the Arts and the Museum of Art of Puerto Rico explored the artistic practices of some of Puerto Rico's most celebrated artists and highlighted the ways in which scientific evidence can be used to shape and inform our understanding of the transmission and transport of materials and knowledge and correct our ideas of an artist's work. The success of this project motivated a series of Chicago-based initiatives with the National Museum of Mexican Art the Tomas Foundation and the Newberry Library, where we studied the use of local and source materials for the production of several colonial era paintings and drawings. Although some of these projects are still in the stage of being interpreted and contextualized, our analysis provided clear evidence for the coexistence and co-use of European and local practices and materials, emphasizing how access to new materials did not always mean an abandonment of old ways. In parallel, Nix began analyzing a gourd in the collection of the Hispanic Society Museum and Library in New York. 
The conservator who proposed this project sought to understand more about this important example of South American lacquerware and how it might reflect indigenous practices in Colombia based on an understanding of its iconographic vocabulary and its material composition. This initial research project seeded by our interaction with the Gord supported further research and the development and execution of an entire international conference focused solely on this art form. Thus far, we've been incredibly successful in building out our network of collaborators, creating content aimed at increasing public interest in the interface of art and science, showcasing the diversity of cultural heritage research paths, and developing entirely new lines of research. We've also began to think about how we can shore up these research hubs for the future through continued communication about the role of science in supporting institutional priorities, anchoring outreach, education, and public engagement into our core missions, and working with our collaborators to make sure that we're acquiring the knowledge and toolkits that are necessary to address the needs of the field. The initiatives that I'm highlighting have real value for the communities in which we live and serve, and it ensures that models like these will not only endure, but pave the way for bringing science to all. And I would like to end on a personal note and say that what inspires me most about this work is that these stories connect the dots of our shared history in a way that uplifts and recognizes the nature of the enduring human spirit and they encourage us to seek out more moments in time where a conversation between scholars from diff all different backgrounds can give rise to an entirely new narrative about who we are. So my name is Mariah Ulinskis, and I'm a member of the Community Archiving Workshop. The Community Archiving Workshop is both the name of the group of audiovisual archivists I'm a part of and the name of the workshop model that we organized. I want to start by um, acknowledging that community archiving is a really broad term, certainly not invented or owned by our group. So it might be helpful when you hear me say the words Community Archiving Workshop, you understand that what I mean in this instance is uh, specifically addressing AV, or recorded media collections. So the Community Archiving Workshop, the group, is a collective of about a dozen audiovisual archivists, mostly in the US, who come together to help jumpstart the preservation of audiovisual collections that are community held. We do this through a one-day workshop where we match AV professionals with community members to process unprocessed AV collections. The workshop focuses on technical skill building, network building, um, the sharing of authority and resources. The workshop takes place in the community that produced the collection or is represented by the content of the collection. And it gives community members the opportunity to describe and prioritize the recordings for preservation. It's a model that works in tandem with models that you might be familiar with in which small collections are removed from the communities that produce them and acquired by large institutions which can provide preservation and access to the recordings. This happens because many communities give up their collections for fear that they cannot care for them. Community Archiving Workshop works to bridge this gap between large institutions and small community organizations by facilitating the sharing of preservation practices and technical resources, and by emphasizing a collaborative process in which community members learn to care for their own collections, and we encourage them to hold on to intellectual, if not physical, control. So the workshop connects organizations to each other regionally. The goal for these or the outcomes for these networks is it allows organizations to use resources effectively they can share equipment, working spaces, and expertise. It provides a safety net and a support system for individuals and small organizations in case of things like emergency or disaster. And it also provides larger organizations clear lines of contact to these smaller orgs. Since 2020, we've been uh, working with a focus on uh, indigenous and tribally held collections. These are workshops that are funded by the NEH and facilitated through our partnership with the Association of Tribal Archives, Libraries, and Museums. 
common motivating factors for the participating organizations is that a lot of these organizations know that their unprocessed collection is valuable, but they don't know exactly what they have in terms of content. The collections are known to contain documentation of endangered traditions, such as examples of storytelling, song and dance. The collections contain oral histories and community histories that are not captured in any other format. And many of these collections serve as the backbone of programs to recapture and retain lost language. The collections also document the establishment of autonomous tribal governments and the organizations which now hold the collections. Additionally, these collections often contain repatriated recordings. Uh, these often contain content that maybe should not have been recorded or were recorded under unethical circumstances, but it is now recognized that they contain information that can be used to pass on knowledge that might have otherwise been lost. So the impact of the Community Archiving Workshop. To date, we have held 18 workshops and established four geographic hubs which serve as peer-to-peer -peer networks for partner organizations. During COVID, we established 10 satellite sites which participated in online training. Everything we do, we document, and all of those resources can be found on the Community Archiving Workshop website. Everything we do, we consider open source and want people to download and reuse freely. This includes training curriculum, templates for inventories, workshop workflows, presentation slide decks with speaker notes. This one will probably be up there. <laughs> um, we're in the process of translating as many of the resources we have to Spanish. And just as a little highlight for a resource, we recently partnered with our friends at the Laboratorio Experimental de Cine in Mexico City to produce an audiovisual preservation version of the Mexican game Loteria. This uh, teaches basic audiovisual archiving terms, and I brought a big stack of them with me for anyone who's interested. Please, please find me, and I'll give you a set. The game and the instructions are also available for download on the call website, and we're hoping to partner with uh, people to translate it to other languages in the future. That's it. Thanks. Alito. Chokma, hello everyone. Saho Chefer Yatrayan. I'm Choctaw and Chickasaw, born and raised in southern Oklahoma. I come from a lineage of Native Americans, immigrants, and outlaws. I come from a place where people watch out for each other, where one has a sense of place and a belonging to the land, where Choctaw and Chickasaw territories overlap in southern Oklahoma, and your community is your family and your home. My father grew up in tribal housing provided through the Chickasaw Nation uh, with his mother and siblings in Caddo, Oklahoma. Subjected to impoverished conditions, he was left on his own at the age of 16 to finish high school. My parents had children young, and we too spent our earlier years in poverty. Despite this, however, my father was determined to overcome the oppressive barriers many Native children face um, in low-income areas uh, by achieving his master's degree. Currently, he is an administrator of a local high school while my mother teaches second grade. The Title I district they work for fosters a safe, nurturing environment and educates mostly low-income and Native students. Influenced by my parents, I seek to empower minority and systemically underrepresented communities through my own passions of collections, care, and conservation. However, I was not aware conservation existed until I was in college for my undergraduate degree. And even then, it seemed unobtainable due to the long, due to the long list of prerequisites and pre-program internship experiences needed in order to apply, as this required more time and money. Uh, the field of conservation has a history of elitism, from barely paid and unpaid preparatory work and internships to a highly competitive professional path with uncertain outcomes after the investment of time, money, and effort. Conservation has been known as a field to be dominantly made up of white individuals from higher socioeconomic backgrounds. An interesting juxtaposition as many cultural heritage materials in museums come from diverse communities. If the field had more people from different communities, we would start to see more collaborations and more culturally appropriate collections care and conservation treatments. 
There's been a refusal to confront the reality that conservators preserve not only the physical and tangible aspects of objects, but also memories, stories, and legacies. Intangible aspects are subject to being lost or changed if they are not cared for or intended to. By emphasizing cultural authority, preserving the physical and intangible becomes ingrained in the work. Recent shifts towards diversifying the field have been pursued by several philanthropic foundations and smaller groups with outreach workshops, workshops and initiatives. When communities are given more authority in the preservation process, formulated solutions are manifested into a more ethical, authentic, and inclusive field. As the conservation graduate programs diversify their cohorts, the field will start to implement more people-based approaches. By having individuals from host communities in these positions, collaborations will be a welcome new standard, and museums can be more proactive in addressing ethical issues directly in their efforts. As a recipient of some of these initiatives through pre-program experiences, I am humbled to be here today. These include the Andrew W. Mellon Opportunity for Diversity in Conservation Workshop at the UCLA Getty Conservation Program, an internship at the National Museum of the American Indian, the Mellon Funded Native Internship at the American Museum of Natural History, and the post back Conservation Internship at the J. Paul Getty Museum. I know several other indigenous and non-traditional students reaching for accessibility through these very opportunities. This includes other Native women uh, more qualified than me um, experiencing rejected pre-program applications, therefore delaying their introduction to the field and efforts toward making conservation more representational. Luckily for you, uh, a determined Native woman refuses to quit and will always find a way. I need to mention the incredibly strong and supportive women who are also in my cohort at UCLA, uh, Taylor Brain, Catherine Panera, Rachel Moore of the Hopi, and Michaela Rollins of the Pime Kawichum. We each have our reasons for pursuing conservation, but we all have come to the conservation table with similar goals. And those are to engage with communities to foster trust, encourage efforts towards reciprocity, and pass generational knowledge both academically and culturally. Representation of diverse perspectives and cultural heritage preservation is very important. The field must reflect the truths of people, therefore the intimate cultural understanding of art and objects in conjunction with their physical properties should be priority. This creates necessary fundamental relationships between conservators, people, and cultures. Although pursuing a career in conservation has been difficult, I'm incredi incredibly grateful for the opportunities awarded to me during my conservation journey. More work needs to be done uh, to make this field more accessible, but no matter the size advocacy efforts take on, they are all efforts worth pursuing and leading the change towards inclusion and authenticity. If not for these efforts, I would not have overcome, I would not have the support systems, nor would I have overcome the barriers that have disproportionately affected low-income individuals and underrepresented people such as myself. The communities and relationships I have become a part of are essential to my success and lend credence to the saying, it truly takes a village. Yokoki, Chokmashki, thank you. Okay, I think this is on, yes, okay. Uh, thank you all for sharing your work, for um, being so honest and really giving us a great overview of the work that you've been doing. Um, we have some time to just think a little bit deeper about some of the things that you've brought up. So um, I want to start by thinking about geography. Um, almost everyone has talked about working locally or working regionally, um, the power of place and the power of community. Um, so I just, I wanted to think a little bit more about what, what that means as we think about the future of conservation. Um, how does thinking locally or regionally, is that, you know, is that an important component of creating change? Uh, and how does that shift how we might think about how we work? So Shane, I want to start with you um, and, and just think about how you think about geography um, in your own work, maybe once you graduate or in sort of the journey you've had so far. Yeah, so I, um, like I said, didn't know about conservation until I had gone off to, um, you know, away from home. And that's one of the barriers that um, I think a lot of 
people in my position face is they kind of have to go away from home in order to gain this experience and these, this education and then um, and trying to bring that uh, sort of back to their areas or back to their communities, they're also faced with challenges as far as like infrastructure and just, you know, community, the abilities of the communities themselves having, um, you know, the ability to have these sort of positions. Um, but yeah. Well, and okay, so right, so and Mariah, when I think about your work, I think about how the community archiving workshop is so um, centered in the communities, but you're sort of popping in and out. So can you talk a little bit about what that means um, and how maybe that can be really great, but maybe some of the issues with that as well? Sure. This is on? Okay. So yeah, community archiving workshop, we do. We drop in, we drop out. We maintain relationships remotely with people afterwards, but I think to answer your question about regional and locality, um, one of the most important aspects of the workshop, like yeah, we teach technical skills and we process these collections, but I think really one of the most important things that happens is people network to each other in the workshop. When we organize a workshop, it is for a specific region. There's usually about 40 or 50 locals who come to participate to get the training, and they sit at the table and they meet each other and they learn about each other's collections and they learn about each other's challenges and they exchange their cards. And it's really about that networking. So many archivists are lone arrangers, and especially I've learned from working, you know, with my work with ATOM, tribal and indigenous archivists are even more geographically, like, just dislocated from a lot of their other professionals. And so creating these regional networks allows people to network to each other, support each other, begin to share things like resources. I will end by just saying, you know, I had a meeting yesterday remotely over Zoom with a couple of our partners. And our partners in California all depended on a organization called California Revealed, which is a statewide, um, it's basically a digital repository. The fact that they had an organization that served the state where people knew that their digitized assets could live and would be cared for by somebody put them at a huge advantage to everybody else in the Zoom who came from states that don't have initiatives like that. And so I would say that there's just, uh, people are so much stronger together and that really needs to happen in many ways locally. Well, and to plug held in trust and what Pam said earlier, a digital repository would be great and perhaps uh, those of you in the audience might have some infrastructure ideas. We know it's a lot to build digital infrastructure. Um, but, but working regionally is not a new concept. Um, and so, you know, Alicia, you talked about the National Science Foundation, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about their model and how uh, your network sort of is thinking about that and emulating that. Yeah, sure. So, like I said, I work for the NSF, Center for Chemical Innovation, and this is one of an earlier um, iterations of programs piloted by NSF to explore this model of diffuse science and the ability to work across the country to address grand challenges that are identified by the proposers. They've recently moved to another phase with regional groups, more so than more that are more diffuse across the entire country, more encompassing in that way. Their models, you have, in my case, we had scientists from 14 institutions, 80 graduate students, all working on one challenge, one question, right? Meeting weekly, in, currently, you know, con consistently being engaged in conversation about what our findings are, how we're moving along towards our objectives, how we can communicate what we're doing, the value of what we're doing to the public, all of those being constant reminder, constantly revisited in our, our, our working. Um, those centers built into their inception, you know, community engagement, outreach, pushing the envelopes on research. And so these are some, some of the things we're trying to mimic, especially with the Center for Scientific Studies in the Arts in Northwestern, and also now at NICS, building in some of the sort of same language about, you know, we want to have broader impacts. We want to make sure that we're really reaching out to students opening up doors to students in meaningful ways other than saying, I'm coming to your high school to talk about what I do, but also providing training opportunities for students to come and do the things that they see in those classrooms. So we're really trying to mimic some of the things we've seen be successful on the you know, federal level in terms of funding and, and their approach into some of these more humanities-based programs. 
Yeah, that, that's great. Thank you. Um, regional labs have kind of been around and for the history of conservation, we've had regional labs for decades now. And Hector, I know you've been re like studying some of the history of regional labs and I feel like there's no um, coincidence that then you are director general of, of a new one in Puerto Rico. So can you just tell us maybe a little bit more on what you've learned about regional labs and part of what has made them successful, but even, I mean, we also see the fold of some of the regional labs. Um, so, you know, just kind of what's your take on the history of regional labs? So, uh, yeah, that it's a <laughs> lot. just take two minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, I think it's interesting because in Puerto Rico, we know that uh, there has been some, uh, you know, projects in the past that have come with the idea of, of making a hub, you know, for to discuss preservation and conservation as, as a broader level. The thing is that right now, um, Puerto Rico government is bankrupt. We don't have institutions that are sustainable long-term to hold that capacity. And I remember when we were developing this that has gotten bigger in the past two years, I was talking with Ellen, I was talking with Debbie and, and other uh, colleagues. And uh, I feel that that model of the regional nonprofit centers makes sense for us. And um, we adapted that model because regional labs here in, in, in mainland US, they usually focus on collections, but we are tailored that model to include also built heritage. And that has been a success so far for us in terms of now that we have a strong reputation of dealing with built heritage, with archeological sites, now we're us um, working with, start working with collections. And also it's interesting because we've been able to capture a lot of audiences that have left, had been left historically um, in the side, you know, of the preservation and conservation uh, discussions. Uh, for example, we was just launched Papel Se Conserva, which is our initiative for the preservation of, of papers, um, books and photographic materials. And we also started not only reaching out archivists and librarians, but also historians, the Puerto Rican Society of Genealogists, you know, and how we include the users in that conversation. So, so we've been successful so far and we've been inspired by conservation labs, definitely. That's great. Um, I, when, when we met sort of to prepare for this panel, I asked all of you what motivates you, um, which was, you know, sort of how we're thinking about this work today. And um, I heard a lot, like I heard some version of sort of creating access to conservation. Um, that's, all of you kind of have this same touch point. Um, and you talked about this when you were um, at the podium, but could we talk, I just want to talk a little bit more about some of um, those barriers to access that you're trying to solve. So what, what are the barriers of access that um, you're trying to solve and sort of what, you know, what's the motivation and the passion that brings you to that? Um, so I'll let you all. If I, uh, I can go first, I think one of, at least from the context in Puerto Rico, is that we don't have enough workshops or labs or spaces to people to, to get their pre-programmed experience. I, for the record, I'm against the pre-programmed experience. The built heritage sector is different in that sense. It creates a barrier for people in Puerto Rico to actually go to move to the uh, US, you know, continental US to get the training they need to become a conservator. So for us it's three, times high, um, you know, riskier to, to enter the field. Uh, so that process of entering the school, becoming a conservator is definitely something that we need to change. Sure, I can jump in because I think, you know, in front of my mind there are several barriers that these models that I'm working in can address. The first of which is obviously providing access to instrumentation and scientific expertise. Not every institution can justify having, you know, a full-scale lab and hiring on a whole team of scientists for their collections, right? But by sharing these resources, we're able to address some of the concerns that they may have about the collections um, in a more meaningful way. There's also the, 
the issue of access in terms of entering the field, right? There aren't very many training programs, particularly in the United States, that are dedicated towards training the next generation of conservation scientists, right? Different than conservators, right? Conservation scientists are a very few gr groups. And without the experience, how do you, number one, know how to get into the door or even know what the career looks like and what it, what it means? And so that's what the initiatives that we're working in really you know, do for us. And lastly, the access to the public. I think, you know, I talked to Francesca last night about you see almost weekly some uncovered painting, some lost underdrawing, some, you know, something very interesting in the public sphere about science and art. And yet, people don't know scientists exist in the field. Even people who work in the field in the same building right next door may not know you exist, right? And so it's, you know, really a, there is a need to clearly communicate and demonstrate, you know, the impact of science in our collections. I think one of the, mo the you know, lowest hanging fruit in that way is working science more clearly into our, ex you know, our exhibitions, into our wall text, in, you know, into our, our catalogs, because it is an integral part of many of the projects that are ongoing in our you know, institutions, and yet it's unknown. So this is another story that's being hidden away you know, from the public eye that I think really needs to be told. You wanna go? Just to piggyback off of what Hector said, I know that there's, um, well, sort of in the vein of accessibility and, and trying to go overcome some of these barriers, I know that there are some programs within the US um, that are working on this as far as bringing conservation to communities themselves. Um, uh, but there definitely needs to be more of them and more, more so geared towards um, uh, providing sort of pre-program workshops um, for people in, within these communities at their communities. Yeah, and I'll just say, you know, speaking specifically to the field of audiovisual archiving, um, there are very few training programs and they're extremely expensive. <laughs> and so very pe few people go through them and it's funny, we were just discussing this at lunch on the receiving end of, of working with the people who've been through those programs. I think that these programs are largely ideological and they're very wedded to technology for very good reason. They're wedded to technological standards, but what you have is people graduating from these programs who are going into the field with unreasonable expectations of what people can actually do. And so, you know, in terms of audiovisual archiving, we have this door that's closing very quickly in terms of magnetic media and when things can get preserved. And we have people who are just frozen in fear because the standards have been set so high and it's not sustainable by most. So, so one thing that we, we, that's coming up and that we talk about quite often is the lack of job opportunities. Um, and that's something that's cited pretty often, but I think what's so exciting about your projects um, is the opportunities that they create. Um, and so I wanted to talk a little bit about that. You know, we're thinking about, uh, thinking about the resilience of the field, about how we're gonna transform the field, and part of that is to create more opportunities, right? So um, I, I wanted to just focus um, on that for a little bit. Um, Hector, do you mind starting, um, and you know, we, we talk about you know, Sencor, as uh, it's, you're, you're in Puerto Rico physically, but you're really thinking about the Caribbean more largely. So can you talk about that? Sure. So uh, one of the most successful approaches that we, we got so far has been to make preservation part of the economic development discussions within our communities. We need to think about uh, preservation and conservation as part of the broader economic development plan for our local communities or local regions. And um, I remember we were having a meeting with the Secretary of Economic Development in Puerto Rico, and we were, we were explaining our project to him, but it was not about preservation and conservation, it was by creating jobs, skilled, trained jobs, for, to insert new people in the job force. So, for us, that has been part of our approach. And uh, because right now for the reconstruction process in Puerto Rico after the hurricanes, we need tradespeople to do the restoration of buildings. We need conservators to work on our damage collections. And by, do by hosting all these projects, we are creating jobs. And that is something that 
I think um, the built heritage sector has been successful so far on, on their book, as he said. I think the museums and collection sector needs to start having that conversation. Yeah, that's great. Um, Maria, I, I see that potential for CA as well, and I was just wondering, um, you know, what kinds of opportunities sort of come up uh, for you as well? Yeah, so we actually were an all-volunteer group until about four years ago when we got our first grant from the Institute of Museum and Library Services. We're actually in the middle of a strategic planning process that's funded by the Mellon Foundation, and what, so a lot to come <laughs> is what that says, but really what we're trying to do is we're trying to create an umbrella under which independent AV archivists can get the support and funnel the funding that they need and get the manpower together that they need to be able to work with in partnership with the collections and communities that they want to help. Um, the field of archives, people are sorely underpaid. You know, there, there, are, there are a lot of people leaving the field right now. You expect people to come out with a master's degree and take a job that pays $40,000 a year. And so we're really, working to create, and we're a very small group, but we're working to create an environment in which we actually recognize each other's labor and expertise. We pay ourselves and each other what we are value, what we see each other's value at, and we are creating as, a, as a healthy of a work environment together as we can. And so we're hoping to produce through our strategic plan recommendations for the field. Well, okay, so that that's great. That's a great segue into what I'd like to think about is is how do we make this work sustainable? Um, and you know, I, I think about Ka because you've been around since 2010, kind of longer than the other projects. And so um, you're you're talking a little bit about you know making sure we're paying equitably and, and strategic planning and thinking about that sustainability. What other lessons maybe do you have um, from Ka about thinking about the sustainability for some of the other projects? We're actually really struggling with that, I'll be honest, and we have a big retreat coming in June because there is a thing that happens when you, when you succeed at what you do and people want to see you formalize your structure is they want to see you become a part of the nonprofit industrial complex. And we don't want to do that because we don't want to spend the rest of our lives um, you know, doing admi grants administration. We want to, we've been incredibly nimble and flexible and lucky to work the way that we do. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, what do I have to share from this? It's really, really hard. I think that there's, you know, we're in a time where we're learning how to work horizontally. We're learning how to work very differently with each other. And we're trying to figure out, like, how do we create this group in a way that it's sustainable, but it holds on to the things that are best about it. Uh, uh so Alicia, your project um, is more at the beginnings of it. So I'll, I'll frame the question a little bit differently for you um, and even for Hector. Um, what do you need to make this work sustainable? So that's a good question. We need buy-in, right? So we're only as successful at what we do as you know our partners, right? So as long as we have collaborators coming in the door with good, solid research questions, we will have a job to do, right? So I think on our end, what we need to do to make ourselves sustainable is to continue to communicate with our collaborators about you know, what value we can add for them in meeting their institutional priorities. It's something that you know, we do with some of our newer partners. We really make sure that what we're developing from the outset is something that is mutually beneficial for both of us in terms of um, providing you know, a forward moving step for research at large but also making sure that we're really meeting the needs of their exhibitions, conservation treatment strategies, that sort of thing. We also need more money and more jobs. Like I said, we were a two-person team at, in Chicago for quite a while, and we're responsible for moving more than 400 pounds of you know, things between us in a family van, right? It's not something that I ever imagined myself doing, ever, but it's something that needed to be done, right? So I think we need more models like this across the field, you know, just to make sure that we're distributing these resources in a more equitable fashion because we are largely centralized now in the Northeast and in California, and we need to make sure that we're, you know, meeting the needs of the rest of the country. From our perspective, I think, yeah, we need resources, economic resources, but I think, um, 
Puerto Ricans has work a crisis over a crisis over a crisis. So, so our work is often framed in that, in that sense. And we have to do less with more. We have to do more with less, sorry. And, and, and think strategically, um, um, think about how to allocating our resources, you know, um, to promote, you know, more training, or to create awareness. People need to understand why we exist, why our services are needed. And that at the same time creates a demand of our work. And that is part of, of why we are doing a, a, a program for education and outreach to our communities. Um, so it's, it's a combination of things to, to make it uh, sustainable and long term. Collaborations and partnerships that create projects, think about how to allocate with a bold decision making process or resources, and also making us visible so people can actually look for us, hire us, you know. <laughs> Um, and Cheyenne, you'll be entering the field soon um, and are coming at it from a bit of a different perspective. So what are your thoughts about the sustainability of the field and sort of, you know, what you need as you move forward? I know when we've talked earlier, you've talked about wanting to return to your community and to really do work um, with and for your community. Um, so, so as you think about sustainability and sort of as the field grows, what do you need from us? Oh, man. Um. <laughs> Support, lots of support, lots of support for other individuals like myself, for people coming up in the field, um, for, you know, within this conversation, bringing, bringing these uh, opportunities to the communities, not having them come to you. And um, yeah, I think I, I'm looking forward to the field of conservation. That's, you know, I wouldn't be here <laughs> if I wasn't. Um, but there are a lot of barriers and a lot of hurdles to go through. Um, and so a driving factor is just trying to make it more accessible to, to everyone, um, including com like communities. So we just have a few minutes left. Um, and I would really like for us to think about the future of the field. Um, and my final question is really, you know, what does the future of conservation look like for you on the ground and at scale? So I'm just going to go down. I'm gonna start with you, Hector. I envision a future when, where the museum sector can collaborate more with the built heritage sector because we face the same issues. We face the same questions and often we don't talk to each other. And um, of course, back in my region, Caribbean region, you know, to have more resources, to have more technical expertise, to uh, envision a more bold preservation of our heritage, you know, in, in, in the time where climate change and all the challenges that we face are coming. So uh, yeah, that's why. Uh, so for me, I think, I've kind of already said this, but I would love to see more models like NICS and NU Access entering into, you know, the conversation just so that, you know, our footprint is, uh, you know, a little bit more vast in what we're doing. I'd also love to see more formal training programs, you know, that center around using science and leveraging science for the advancement of our understanding of our, our culture and, and art. Um, I think that's something that's critically important I think it should be moved, you know, to a national priority because it's something that is incredibly valuable for all of us. It's not something that only serves, you know, a small community. It's something that really ties us all together, and it's something we really need in the moments that follow, you know, some of the last couple of years. So. I see more people from these communities um, taking positions within these museums, um, holding space and authority within the, this realm of uh, the museum field, um, opening access to more local tribal community centers. Um, um, yeah, I, I think that's, that's really um, just making it more accessible. It's really just what we're about. Um, similar to something that Hector said earlier about just 
normalizing a budget line for preservation. I've often wanted to do that with organizations that I work with. These are often very small cultural and community-based organizations who have years been producing media and had a line in their budget for production, but they've never thought to have a line for preservation. And these are organizations that can't prioritize that because they are barely making payroll. And so while I have the air of funders here, I would say, be the ones to step forward and offer to create that line for all of those organizations so that they explicitly have funds that are for the preservation of the body of work they have produced. Because if they don't, then what was all of this for? Awesome, well, we're at time, so I'd love to give a big round of applause to all of our panelists, thank you. I would like to thank everyone participating in this panel for your important insights, truly. You have all given us much to think about during the coffee break, coffee, that starts right now. For those of you watching on YouTube, you will see one slide until 4.10 p.m. Eastern time when the streaming program will resume. For those who are here in person, please return to your seats no later than 4.05 p.m and please consider switching rooms in order to experience the convening in both of these beautiful historic spaces. Thank you again.
everyone. Hello, everyone. I hope you have enjoyed meeting and reconnecting with so many interesting colleagues. Now a reminder that our program will resume in five minutes, five minutes sharp. Thank you. Hello again. It is now my pleasure to introduce Brent Leggs, the founding executive director of the African American Cultural Heritage Action Fund and a senior vice president of the National Trust for Historic Preservation. His biography can be accessed via the QR code. Please join me in welcoming Brent Leggs. How's everybody doing? All right. I have the good fortune to broaden our conversation today to talk about the importance of preserving historic buildings and landscapes and the stories that are imbued in these cultural, mon cultural monuments of memory. As you heard, I'm the founding executive director of the African American Cultural Heritage Action Fund at the National Trust for Historic Preservation. We were founded in 2017 in the aftermath of Charlottesville. And you all remember that moment where culture, heritage, and public spaces collided in negative and violent ways. But it also was an opportunity at a crisis. It was an opportunity for us at the National Trust for Historic Preservation and those of us in the world of cultural conservation to demonstrate that our work, our profession, plays an important role in American society. Thus, we envisioned a five-year, $25 million campaign to support the preservation of 100 Black Heritage sites nationwide. Thank you. Celebrating our fifth anniversary year, we have raised $91.5 million. Yeah. Supported 202 grantee projects nationwide and established a $14 million endowment 
that will ensure the financial sustainability and the continued leadership of the Action Fund. Part of the reimagining of preservation practice is to support communities in accessing the resources and the technical knowledge to help redress imbalances in our field. This really is the ethos and purpose of the Action Fund, and we do this within our own understanding of history, preservation, and social justice. We're fortunate to work at a national scale with resources and partnerships like many of the partners that I've seen in your slides today, the Mellon Foundation, the Ford Foundation, JPB, Lilly Endowment, and so many others that's resourcing this bold vision for our nation. But with my time today, I want to highlight stewardship practice. And we have a three-part approach with that. Starting with the work of preservation practice. Our work is not meant to preserve a building, a story, a place for the present moment. This is perpetual work. And so when we first engage with communities, we want to assess the needs of these communities and support them in realizing their vision. So I'm sure you have heard of one of our preservation projects, the Nina Simone Child at Home that is in Tryon, North Carolina. When we engage with four artists, including Adam Pendleton, in 2017, we had this shared singular vision that Nina Simone deserved a physical place that would hold her memory and legacy so that that legacy would endure. So we've actively, actively been working to preserve this unadorned, humble piece of vernacular architecture that holds national significance as well as the landscape. And we will start construction later this summer. And our idea here has expanded beyond the footprints of this singular place because it sits within a historic black neighborhood. And so we are thinking how to introduce a new use and program vision that respects the historic residential context and broadens the stewardship strategy to include the Masonic Temple, the historic black church where Nina Simone's mother was a pastor, and the black cemetery. You all remember the news when a devastating tornado ripped through the Southeast United States in November of 2021, and it devastated Western Kentucky, including historic St. James AME Church. Mayfield is a small rural community. Literally the entire downtown was decimated by extreme weather and the increasing harms of climate change. We wanted to ensure that the history of that community wasn't lost. This is an example of preservation as rescue work. We are actively raising $1.8 million. We've raised almost 600,000 and advanced two phases of this work. But we're also demonstrating that historic preservation is climate resiliency. And so as we organize local and national technical leaders to help us to understand how to rebuild this building with greater engineering and structural strength, you can see the, the steel beams that ensures that the building is stronger to be able to mitigate the anticipated harms of increased weather and climate. I'm sure you heard the news of the ongoing battle for structural parity and co-equal stewardship at a presidential site in Virginia. In 2019, we brought together 50 practitioners to develop a rubric on teaching slavery interpretation and preservation, a new best practice for the field, and in particular for traditional sites that have a growing ethic for telling the full history and advancing equitable interpretation. But we wanted to go beyond telling stories or new stories yet to be told. We wanted to explore ways that 
descendants with a direct connection to a historic site could share in the governance and stewardship and the perpetual stewardship of a place of national distinction. You all have heard that we were able to secure structural parity and today 50% of the board of trustees at the James Matt at the Montpelier Foundation is represented by people that look like me. This is innovation and historic preservation and it is a world model for traditional sites to advance meaningful equity and justice. Now I want to talk about interpretation because stewardship and the work of preserving artifacts and collections whether it's buildings or landscapes or objects. We use these assets to tell stories. Anybody heard of Sojourner Truth? In 1851, she delivered what has become known as the Ain't I a Woman speech on the front steps of a Universalist church in Akron, Ohio. Unfortunately, the church no longer stands, and today there's the YMC building in Akron. This poses a powerful question. How do you interpret and memorialize history when the physical evidence no, is no longer visible? Our work is about highlighting that preservation is interpretation and design. And so we are working with a black landscape architect, Dion Harris, artist and sculptor Woodrow Nash, and the local community, and we have a three-part interpretation strategy that is international, national, and local. The international is because Sojourner Truth, her father is from Ghana, and their national flower is the Impala Lily, which is the centerpiece of the new plaza. The national story is obviously the legacy of, of Sojourner Truth. But when we got engaged and learned that there is no public history site in Akron interpreting Akron's local black history, we wanted to imbue within this new plaza the stories of black women that have sojourned in truth's footsteps. Literally, yeah. So we are shining a light on this history and ensuring that their stories are told as well. This is a National Trust Historic Site in Virginia. What's interesting about this is through our fellowship program, we're working with a historical interpreter named Cheney, who you see in this image. She purchased African fabrics but she used traditional sewing techniques of the former enslaved from this plantation site as a way of engaging the public and visitors through art and a new form of interpretation. Now I want to talk about the work of management. I'm sure you heard the name John Coltrane and hopefully his wife's name, Alice, inside of this ranch house is where he spent a week isolated and composed A Love Supreme. It's where Alice recorded her first five albums in their basement studio. This is a place that expresses art, culture, and black romantic life and love. There are stories imbued in this building and this three acre landscape that need to be told. But the work of helping an organization who organized locally to prevent a threat of demolition in 2003. No resources or technical knowledge. So our work is a three part approach, helping them to understand nonprofit management, preservation planning, and fundraising so that they can advance a phased approach. And I'm glad to say that after two decades, they have secured a million dollar grant from the Mellon Foundation. We have invested almost $500,000 
so that they could hire paid staff and advance pl preservation planning activities. And the board has adopted their program vision for reuse. This site has a bright future ahead. The Emmett Till Interpretive Center. This is where the trial for the murder of Emmett Till was held and two white men would be set free by an all-white jury. It was a catalytic moment in U.S. history. It was a predecessor to George Floyd's murder. We could only imagine the way that it shook the consciousness and the soul of our nation. It was a moment that ignited the civil rights movement. We currently are, are supporting this organization by helping them to hire their very first director of education and interpretation that will expand the history imbued within this courthouse. We're also working at Roberts Temple Church of God in Christ in Chicago, which is where Emmett's mother, Mamie Till Mobley, made the courageous decision to have an open casket funeral to let the world see. In essence, this is the Anne Frank story of America. So we are partnering with Dr. Revan Wheeler, who you see in this image, who is the only surviving witness and a family member, and his wife, Dr. Marvel Parker, who is leading a preservation organization. We currently are advocating to President Biden to use his executive authority under the Antiquities Act of 1906 to establish a national monument and memoriam as an example of racial violence and legal injustice, but most importantly, to uplift the overlooked contribution of black women in the American Civil Rights Movement. If you're ever in Brooklyn, I hope you get a chance to tour historic Weeksville Heritage Center. This organization was founded by the legendary activist Joan Maynard. It's more than 50 years old, and they steward Hunterfly Row Houses, which you see here. We helped to fund a new staff position so they could hire the very first preservation manager that could oversee preservation planning and the stewardship work here. We believe this is a model for other preservation groups to ensure that they have the technical capacity and paid positions to help preserve their historic assets. Has anybody toured 16th Street Baptist Church? Well, I hope everyone will take a tour the next time you're in Birmingham. We know the history here. Connected to 1963 in September, when four young girls were murdered by Klansmen. That's only one part of their history. This place holds a multiplicity of stories. It was designed by the second licensed professional black architect in America, Wallace Rayfield. This building sits in the heart of a historic black neighborhood. It's an example of where black communities with black money would create community and magnificent pieces of architecture. Our work through our $20 million Preserving Black Churches program is to support black churches in establishing endowments that will sustain the physical preservation of our national history. And of the 35 churches that shared $4 million when we made an announcement in January, three received endowment and financial sustainability grants, including 16th Street. So we seeded $200,000 towards a $2 million fundraising goal. And I was in Birmingham with the church congregation two weeks ago as they kicked off this campaign. This is the blueprint for sustaining the cyclical preservation and maintenance of our shared assets, and that's one component of the work. We believe that it is unfair that a historic black church with an aging congregation and a bold legacy has to secure the funding by themselves. 
So we want to develop an economic impact analysis of the civil rights economy in Alabama and make an argument to the state so that they begin to invest in the preservation and maintenance of civil rights sites and share the social responsibility of stewarding these places that's driving a six billion dollar economy, tourism economy in Alabama. I just want to leave you with some departing words. The work of historic preservation today is about telling the full history. It is about creating room for diverse professionals to drive innovation in practice. It is about data-driven and equity-driven outcomes. It's about ensuring that all Americans can see themselves and their potential and their history in the historic African American places and diverse places that surround them. Thank you for your ongoing work and your commitment to equity and justice and conservation and historic preservation. I have to just begin by saying how move, what a moving day it's been to hear all of this work. Um, it's a sentiment that I know is shared by our many, many colleagues from NEH here today. My name is Brianne Greenfield. I'm the Division Director for Preservation and Access at NEH. And I am Tatiana Ausima. I'm a Senior Program Officer in the Office of Challenge Programs. And so as we've heard already, and most of us know firsthand, this gathering and the Held in Trust project come at a time of transition and opportunity. As cultural heritage practitioners, funders, policymakers, we're all grappling with how to respond to the present moment and affect meaningful and sustaining change. But this moment isn't unprecedented. The field of conservation and indeed our nation has been through times of transition before. As the leading government funding agency for humanities work, NEH understands the importance of taking a leadership role by offering funding opportunities that encourage the field to meet the moment and prioritize innovative solutions. Since its creation in 1965, NEH has awarded more than 5.6 billion for humanities projects through more than 64,000 grants. By 1986, the endowment articulated its first preservation mission statement which responded to the then crisis surrounding deterioration of paper-based materials and collections. The statement read in part, the ability to study our cultural and intellectual heritage depends on the availability of primary and secondary sources documenting that heritage. To ensure that the information contained in the most significant of these documents will be preserved and made available for the continuing work of scholarship and the humanities, the endowment has established an Office of Preservation. This office, which is now the Division of Preservation and Access, along with other divisions and endowment leadership, has established funding priorities that advance the field of conservation through a series of programs and special grants over nearly four decades. While there's not time today to go through all of these initiatives, you'll recognize many as transformative for the field of conservation. Microfilming 60 million pages of newsprint as part of the United States newspaper program. Protection of over 29 million objects through environmental stabilization grants. And development of national standards for photographic enclosures and storage materials. Ongoing interagency work in the areas of disaster response and recovery has provided over $35 million of emergency relief to cultural organizations after natural or man-made disasters such as hurricanes, acts of terrorism, wildfires, and now the pandemic. With other funders and the hard work of many, many, many NEH grantees and partners, many of which are in the audience right now, these efforts have developed an infrastructure for preservation in the United States that includes education, best practices, new technologies, and most importantly, the preservation of significant collections nationwide. And today, as NEH Chair Shelley Lowe explained to us earlier, 
Under her leadership, the agency is embarking on American Tapestry, an initiative to leverage the humanities to address some of the nation's greatest challenges, and to do so focusing in three critical areas. Those are democracy, equity, and climate change. This focus, as you've heard, has produced new grant programs in all areas of the agency's work, including a grant program we know as Climate Smart, a program that builds institutional capacity to develop strategic climate action plans. It supports comprehensive action through very practical activities, such as energy audits, building and mechanical system evaluations, um, assessments also of location-specific climate risks. The program's goal is to ensure that cultural heritage organizations build a long-term future by both reducing their impacts on the environment and by ensuring that the critical collections and programs they house are safeguarded from environmental risk, especially given the volatile dynamics of climate change. Another of NEH's programs specifically related to collections is the Cultural and Community Resilience Program. CCR promotes community collecting. The program was really born out of the recognition that cultural heritage has the potential to play a crucial role in strengthening and sustaining communities in the face of disruptions of climate change and COVID-19. But for culture to play that role, for it to play that active, positive role, it itself needs to be protected. It needs to be available. And such, this program will support projects that identify, document, collect, and safeguard cultural heritage, both tangible and intangible, as well as programs to document contemporary experiences with COVID-19 and climate change, and to provide opportunities such as through oral history projects for individuals and communities to reckon with the social, economic, and emotional impact. And I have to say, I was really excited to hear uh, Chair Lowe's announcement earlier of uh, sharing this uh, new initiative that we have with the Department of the Interior, a historic partnership to advance a project ongoing with federal Indian boarding schools and to uncover the legacy of American policy in that area and the devastating impact of the schools created that truly ripped children from their homes, their families, their language, and their culture. And that was, I think, one of her first announcements of that program earlier today because it, it was finally finalized and announced this week. So uh, to be on this moment is, is really uh, just important. I know that as NEH foregrounds democracy and equity and, and climate in its work, that it puts us on a, a journey that is very much like the journey that the cultural conservation field is engaging with and held in trust as well. Indeed, held in trust similarly recognizes the opportunity for conservation and preservation fields to evolve in such a way to address the pressing issues of our time. I know that all of us here recognize the power of cultural heritage to strengthen the social fabric. Cultural heritage sustains identity, reinforces social bonds, and the means for mutuality, cooperation, and trust. I always like that image of cultural heritage in the humanities as mirrors and windows, mirrors to reflect on ourselves, our values, our beliefs, and windows for us to appreciate and understand others. But that power only exists when cultural heritage is activated for all. When we empower and center communities, especially those that have been historically underrepresented or minoritized, when we ensure that a healthy future is going to be available and address environmental sustainability in our buildings, in our materials, and in our practices, 
and when we frame our collection growth decisions in the context of ethical stewardship and judicious employment of resources as well. Those we know are big steps, but when we take them, the stewardship of our cultural heritage provides a rich platform to grow a vibrant and diverse future for all of humanity. So as Chair Lowe noted in her remarks, the implementing the findings of Held in Trust requires the full investment of the entire conservation community, government, private funders, and cultural heritage stewards throughout the United States. The impact of this evaluation will only be as robust as our collective willingness to undertake the work. As noted previously, NEH has already made a $500,000 investment to support the findings of Held in Trust through the Climate Resources Resilience Project, which will allow cultural heritage sites to increase their awareness of climate risks and events, develop the knowledge and skills needed to take the steps of climate resilience, and provide tools needed to establish collective learning. These materials will be essential for cultural heritage organizations of all sizes as they confront the climate crisis, but is just one very small step towards moving from surviving to thriving. Looking ahead, we hope that NEH funding through American Tapestry will continue to be impactful and transformational in helping cultural institutions build resilience, fostering new ideas, approaches, and solutions, in changing how we think about some of the most pressing issues of our time. This means highlighting and sharing the wealth of knowledge developed within the conservation community to build resiliency, add context and understanding, strengthen participation in civic life and our country's democratic process. As our collective work unfolds, it's also important to stay mindful that for every historical event or issue, there are multiple sides, stories and perspectives. That even within a single community or family, there are multiple parallel histories, and the first step towards understanding is a respect for those perspectives and a willingness to hear them. NEH will continue its important work in helping support historical resources about our nation's founding and open avenues to include parallel and unknown histories in the national narrative. But this work is our collective responsibility, and each person and organization must see themselves in the effort. Together, we can work towards creating a more vibrant and resilient future, one that prioritizes climate, communities, collaboration, and cooperation, as well as conservation. Thank you. Hello. My name is Suzanne Davis, and I am happy to be here today. I'm getting some microphone instructions. Okay, okay, is this working, Kate? All right. So in my day job, I had the conservation department at the University of Michigan's Kelsey Museum of Archaeology, and I'm speaking to you today in my role as the president of the American Institute for Conservation, which is the largest membership organization for conservation cultural heritage professionals in the world. So for the Held and Trust Project, I served on the Community Engagement and Storytelling Working Group. And as I understand it, the central animating question for this entire project has been, what does the field of conservation look like if it has everything it needs? And so from the perspectives of community and storytelling, I'm going to give two answers to that question, and I'll start with a story. Now I could tell you wonderful stories about conservation and community from my work on archeological sites around the world, but instead I'll focus on a heritage site in the United States that's been important to me personally. So I grew up in Georgia in a small town about 30 miles northwest of Atlanta. And um, I'm a, I guess I should say, just to help you like imagine this. So today the area around Atlanta is very highly developed, but when I was a kid, there were still miles of countryside. And I'm a child of the 70s and the 80s, and this was before computers or mobile phones or before people like planned schedules for their children like, really tightly. <laughs> and um, my friends and I had the kind of upbringing where as long as we were getting our homework and our chores done, our parents weren't overly concerned with where we were or what we were doing. And one of the main things we were doing was exploring all of that undeveloped land where we found a lot of very interesting things. And one of those things was a cemetery. It was about a mile from my house, it was down a little country road, and it was completely hidden in the woods. It seemed very old. 
It was totally covered with trees and bramble, and it had a special kind of otherworldly feeling about it. And my friend Robin and I liked to go there, and we would try to read the names and the dates on the headstones and imagine who the people were and why they were buried there. And one time, when we were walking back along the little country road, we met a man, and he told us that it was an old burial ground for enslaved people. So Robin and I were about 12 years old at the time, and we were studying history in our social studies class at school, and so we had learned about the history of enslaved labor and the United States, and especially our own state of Georgia, but it seemed remote and abstract. All of the kids that I knew at school, white and black alike, were not from Georgia. Our parents had all moved there from somewhere else, and they were engineers, or they were pilots, or they worked in the insurance industry, or they had some other kind of professional job. So this brutal history of the South and the country, it didn't seem especially real to me. But the gravestones in the woods weren't abstract. And they were my first real clue that the history I'd read about in my school books had happened to real people and in my own neighborhood. And Robin and I were more fascinated by that cemetery than by the Great Pyramids at Giza, because the place down the road from our houses was part of our world. And we wanted to know who were those people? Where had they come from? Where had they worked? How had they died? And as I got older, the cemetery received attention in the form of research and preservation. And I learned that it had been founded in 1853 by a free black man named John Jennings. And there are more than 300 graves there. And it's associated with the old Friendship Baptist Church, which is no longer located near the cemetery, but it still exists today. And it's the oldest black congregation in Cobb County, Georgia. My childhood fascination with Rocky Spring Cemetery changed the course of my life. I pursued conservation in part because I wanted to have the kind of job where I worked to conserve places like it. And today I work at three archeological sites that preserve the ancient cemeteries of African kings and queens. And this is the power of conservation. The things we preserve change people's lives. Historic cemeteries, art, artifacts, archeological sites, they tell us who we are. They help us remember, they let us explore and discover, and they inspire us. Rocky Spring Cemetery, the burying ground of the Old Friendship Baptist Church preserves important stories of individual people, a congregation, and even a nation. And yet it's struggled. It has struggled for attention, it's struggled for money, and it's struggled for archeological and conservation expertise. And everything it's ever received has come because of members of its local community. And if conservation had everything it needed, communities in this country would easily be able to access partnerships to preserve their local history because while community members are highly motivated to preserve sites like Rocky Springs, most people already have day jobs. And it's not reasonable to expect them to also acquire specialist knowledge in grant writing and submission, <laughs> historic preservation, architecture, archeology, span conservation, or collections care. If we want to preserve heritage that's unique and meaningful to local communities, we have to be willing to invest in a fully collaborative model where conservation projects are developed with communities. Do you still have more? Just lost my place a little bit. I need to look at my notes for a moment. Um, so in my perfect world, you should be able to pick up the phone or go online and be connected with an experienced professional who can come to your site and meet with you, talk, assess, help you make a plan and get the work done. And in my perfect world, um, an organization like FAIC would have the funding to support this work. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, connections to people all over the country to do it. And it would be a lot like a program that FAIC runs right now, the Conservation Assessment Program. But that program is really intended for museums and it funds assessment and that implementation. And in my perfect world, communities would easily be able to access the full range of support they need to conserve their local heritage, whether sites or collections. Now I told you I had two answers to the question, what does the field look like if it has everything it needs? And that was answer one. Communities could easily access partnerships to conserve their local heritage. And for answer two, I am going to start by asking you a question. How many of you here today whatever room you're in, if you're in the members room or here, how many of you would describe yourselves as professional storytellers? Okay, I see some hands, so that's good. Um, if you work, your hand should definitely be up, Kaylee. <laughs> yeah, if you work in the field of cultural heritage conservation, I think that your hand should be up right now, and what I'm about to say next is really for you. 
So like me, you are probably not trained in journalism or public relations, and you probably don't have a degree in communication studies. But I'm a professional storyteller, and so are you. Because from public lectures, to YouTube videos, to blog posts, funding applications, and articles in scholarly journals, we are writing and speaking about our work all the time. And one of the most important things we can do to support the future of our field is to get great at storytelling and to be clear about why work, our work matters. For more than a century, conservation has affiliated itself strongly with the sciences. But our work doesn't matter because of the intricacies of the science. That is not what grabs the hearts and minds of the public, of sponsors, or even of museum leadership. Our work matters because of the stories we uncover and preserve. And to make a compelling case for conservation, we have to connect to the what and the why of our work more than to the how. We care about historic cemeteries because they preserve evidence of individual lives and communities. And we care about Whistler's painting of his mother or the quilts of G's Bend because they are deeply personal artistic expressions. We care about the Declaration of Independence because it shaped the future of a nation. And while those stories could simply be written down and preserved somewhere, they wouldn't have the same resonance without the object itself. The physical thing is a tangible connection to the past, to other people, places, and times like Rocky Springs was for me. And this is the power of what conservators do. Now to improve our craft as storytellers, we can learn about structure and syntax, the personal anecdotes that make a story come alive, and how to write a great lead. We need storytelling and writing workshops. We need communications, op-ed, and media training. And an even bigger part of the craft is paying careful attention to what we're preserving whose stories are being told, and which voices are centered in the telling. And this kind of training would support and benefit practitioners across every work setting in our field. For the future of conservation in the US to have everything it needs, we have to be willing to invest in collaborative community partnerships and in storytelling as integral parts of the discipline. So many of us working in the cultural heritage space see these activities as ancillary or extra to our quote unquote real work. But they're not. They're at the heart of everything we do. And to do them well, we have to prioritize them. We have to spend time, effort, and money on them. We need to embrace them and invest in them so that when somebody working in the field of conservation says to you, let me tell you a story, you will know that you're about to hear something both fascinating and meaningful. Thanks. Very awkward. I've never read from my laptop before, so I want to apologize in advance if, if my laptop falls. Thank you for your patience. Watsi Hopa. Good afternoon. It is a great pleasure to be with all of you today. <clears throat> I extend my gratitude to the Foundation for Advancement and Conservation for their foresight and commitment to enhance meaningful and collaborative work with communities. Initiatives centered on the conservation and preservation of cultural heritage will benefit from these important and timely efforts of which all of you are engaged. My Akama name is Hrak Aishthua, which means Black Mesa. My ancestors built and settled Kashkacht, known as Mesa Verde today, and Wafpa Shaka, Chaco Canyon located in north central New Mexico before arriving at Agu, my, my hometown of Acoma Pueblo. My upbringing at, at Acoma is the basis for my understanding of the natural world, my culture, and history. I draw inspiration from this traditional knowledge and the continued teachings passed on to me from family elders, my parents, 
and cultural leaders. I take seriously my inherent responsibility to uphold Acoma culture, language, core values, and oral history, which in this time are so critical to the survival of my tribe. Much of my work over the last 30 years has been in the areas of cultural resources management, historic preservation, advocacy for the, for the protection of sacred sites, museums, the arts, and cultural tourism. Interest in this field of work is a direct result of my appointment as Lieutenant Governor for my tribe in 1991, just a year after the passage of the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. Since then, I have had the privilege to work for my tribe as its first director of the Historic Preservation Office and later as director of the Sky City Cultural Center and Agu Museum. Many doors were opened as a result of these opportunities, including the development of partnerships with federal and non-governmental institutions, agencies, museums, and the private sector, namely, namely collectors of Native American art. From building a long-term and mutually rewarding relationship with the National Trust for Historic Preservation that resulted in the designation of Acoma San Esteban del Rey Mission as a National Historic Preservation site and the associate implementation of a comprehensive rehabilitation plan to the most recent passage of the Safeguard Tribal Objects of Patrimony Act or STOP Act of 2022, a new law designed to address the ongoing problem of illegal exportation of Native American sacred and ceremonial items. Great progress is being made and higher bars are being set for the important work that lies ahead. Most notable is the acknowledgement of tribal sovereignty and the opportunities that become more prevalent when tribal leaders are afforded a voice and a role in policy development at all levels of government. This process will ensure the protection of cultural heritage and really the sustainability of native people in this country. I want to acknowledge those museums throughout the world who have created projects and established more permanent components within their operations that foster inclusivity and are rooted in a commitment to collaboration. While some initiatives are loose in their intent and do not necessarily result in the most successful outcomes, many are developed and implemented in partnership with Native American communities and most importantly, supported by the highest levels of leadership within the institution. <clears throat> Some of our country's most prominent institutions are now engaged in more meaningful work and are investing both the human and financial resources required to facilitate consultation on the many complex issues facing our museums, including conservation and general collection stewardship, repatriation, and access. In addition to developing the internal framework, many institutions are hiring Native American professionals organizing advisory committees, and providing a seat for Native Americans at the board table. These actions are so also critical to the advancement of this work. During my tenure as director of the Indian Arts Research Center at the School for Advanced Research in Santa Fe, New Mexico, I inherited an initiative of which I was already involved, but that was born as a result of an expressed need presented to my predecessor uh, Dr. Cynthia Chavez Lamar, now director of the National Museum of the American Indian here in Washington, D.C., but presented by Landis Smith, a conservator at the Laboratory of Anthropology in Santa Fe, and her colleagues, some of you are in the room today, <clears throat> who shared concerns about a need for guidelines that would address a gap in consultation and collaboration where conservation of Native American materials were concerned. Following a seminar and subsequent sessions that brought together cons conservators and other native and non-native mu museum professionals, cultural experts, museum administrators, and native artists to discuss the many issues surrounding the, this need, a set of guidelines emerged that not only addressed conservation, but also addressed other concerns and gaps in museum and tribal relations. Three years and numerous convenings later, the guidelines for collaboration were published online. 
one set for museums and the other for tribes. These guidelines set the tone for additional seminar, conference presentations, and projects hosted by the Indian Arts Research Center and, and inform the center's involvement in projects outside of the Santa Fe Institution. Sorry, I keep forgetting to advance. I'm gonna backtrack and say this is, this is Akama. <laughs> <clears throat> And before I talk about other, some initiatives being led by Native mu museum professionals and scholars, um, I, I want to express that this initiative around the guidelines has really just set the stage for more meaningful consultation. There are now, um, there is now a project um, in development um, the creation of Indigenous Collections Care Guide. Um, the group of individuals is working with the AAM uh, to advance and, and eventually publish these, these guides. This is so important, and I'm so thankful to the many uh, conservators and other museum professionals and tribal representatives who have been engaged in this process. Now I want to take a, uh, I want to mention briefly a few projects which I have uh, been involved that are a direct result of the guidelines for collaboration. These projects, appearing straightforward in their objectives, unveiled both long-standing deficiencies in museum practice and engagement with source communities and negative histories associated with collecting and presentation of Native American materials. Conversations on these and other issues of concern, including representation, cultural sensitivities, conservation, and display led to more robust and, quote, outside of the box thinking <clears throat> and approaches to problem solving. As an advisor to the Metropolitan Museum of Art on the development of an exhibit of Native American art from the Charles and Valerie Diker collection, I joined other Native and non-Native scholars and museum professionals at a time in the exhibit development where most of the planning had already occurred, including the selection of items for display. While this was not ideal, an ideal starting point, it was an important action on the part of the museum to engage Native people. It was clear the Met did not anticipate some of the expressed concerns and specific requests made by advisory committee members. They did, however, listen and were proactive in their response to the, guided, the guidance being offered. In consideration of pending and future work with Native American collections at the Met, the committee offered recommendations including the need to hire an indigenous curator who would be responsible for advancing discourse on the issues and work towards developing a more solid framework for Native American representation and inclusion at the Met. Patricia Marquine Norby, who is Purapecha, was hired as Associate Curator of Native American Art and has hit the ground running, developing both short and long-term strategies for the Native American collection and gallery within the American Wing, which is designated for the presentation of Native American art. Working collaboratively with Native artists and others, Dr. Norby and her colleagues, including Sylvia Yant, Curator in Charge of the American Wing, have already taken positive steps to address pending problems while also curating important exhibitions that showcase both historic and contemporary Native art. In 2018, during a visit to the Met, I presented Sylvia with the idea of curating an exhibit of historic Pueblo pottery from the Indian Arts Research Collection at the Met. <clears throat> Later that year, Sylvia informed me that the Met would work with the uh, center on such an exhibit. Since then, the Indian Arts Research Center team, in partnership with the Met and New York City-based Vilcek Foundation, have worked together to generate resources to support the exhibit. One of the most profound outcomes of this process undertaken to curate this exhibit was the creation of what's known as the Pueblo Pottery Collective, a group of 70, of 70 Pueblo tribal members a community-based group comprised of artists, scholars, culture bearers, and others 
who all contributed to what is now known as Grounded in Clay, the Spirit of Pueblo Pottery, which will open at the Met and the Vilcek Foundation Gallery in July of this year, and will travel to other museum venues throughout the country. This is a long story, but an important one, as it is a testament to what is possible when source communities are provided an opportunity to act actively engage in museum work. Around the same time, the Field Museum in Chicago had announced the rehabilitation of the Native American Hall and replacement of the 70-year-old exhibit, which called for the deinstallation of over 1,500 objects. A Native American advisory committee was established to work alongside the team of curators, conservators, and other museum representatives over the course of five years. While the rehabilitation and planning for a new exhibit was the objective, it was clear, even after the first meeting of the committee, that other issues were of great concern and required the attention of the museum's leadership. The committee members felt strongly that the exhibit could not, only be, could not be the only focus, that it would be a disservice to Native America if we ignored the other equally important and weighing issues. With a collective voice, our concerns were heard by the museum's former president and members of the Board of Trustees. The conversations continue with the new leadership at the Field Museum, and during a time of restructuring and search for a new curator, preferably one who is indigenous. After, even after the opening of Native Truths, Our Voices, Our Stories in 2022, the committee, now comprised of reappointed and new members from across the country, remains committed to addressing pending issues of concern in partnership with the current president and other key museum staff. Some of the issues include conservation of those items deinstalled from old, the old exhibit, repatriation of ancestors and their associated funerary objects, collection stewardship, and inclusion of native people within the institution. <clears throat> We can learn from each other, and we can work together to resolve issues and to, and to fill gaps in understandings of what museums have in their collections. Tribes are prepared, and in some cases, waiting for an opportunity to be engaged in this work. <clears throat> With a growing number of Native American muse museum professionals, there is great promise and opportunity to not only right the wrongs, but to collaborate, to think more critically and creatively about how we can foster a new narrative and process for meaningful consultation. I am grateful that universities, government-operated and private institutions are reaching out to Native experts, seeking guidance on how best to create projects and programs for collaboration. In some circumstances, museums are being reactive to the revisions of the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act and its associated accountability that will guide this next phase of implementation. Other institutions are genuinely interested in working with source communities to develop exhibitions, modify or create policies around collection stewardship, and develop new programming centered on access to collections that support tribal initiatives focused on traditional arts revitalization language and cultural preservation, and advocacy on the protection of ancestral and cultural landscapes. Just this past weekend, I participated in the official launch of a new publication at the de Young Museum in San Francisco. The catalog, Native American Art from the Thomas W. Weisel Family Collection, features a significant gift of materials representing tribes from throughout the country. The museum also established an advisory committee to assist with the assessment of the collection and with the development of the catalog, a deliverable associated with the collector's gift. This catalog is unique for many reasons, including the intentional omission of certain objects the advisors flagged as culturally sensitive. In some cases, other sensitive materials are presented as graphic renderings created by Native artists. The catalog also includes written contributions by over 80 Native representatives. The next step in this process, as recommended by the advisors, is, to create, is the creation of a Native American curatorial committee uh, who will work directly with museum curators, conservators, preparators, and others to curate a new exhibit featuring items 
from the gifted collection. In addition, the advisory committee will continue working with the museum to discuss issues around consultation, pending repatriations, and collection stewardship. I hope that what I have shared today inspires you to think about how you can be part of this movement. Collaborative work is crucial. It informs and educates us and provides for innovative ideas. <clears throat> as a former tribal and cultural, as a former tribal leader and cultural leader, and a contributor to, towards these initiatives, I am excited about our future work together and to realizing a more active engagement of Native people and my own Acoma people in transforming cultural heritage conservation. My people live a life of resiliency. We have to in order to provide for the generations yet to come. Thank you. been waiting for me because after me we party <laughs> <laughs> greetings my name is Janelle Austin I am a daughter sister auntie neighbor and memorial caretaker at George Floyd Square in Minneapolis Minnesota I am also the executive director of the George Floyd Global Memorial with an academic background in culture and theology. It is such a privilege and honor to be with all of you today. I would like to begin by giving thanks. I give thanks to God and to the earth, for we often say at George Floyd Square that the earth protests with us and God is on our side. <laughs> I give thanks to the Ojibwe and Dakota peoples on whose land we do justice work in Minnesota. And to the Piscataway Kanoi, I hope I said that right, tribe, uh, Piscataway Indian Nation, and the Nakachtank, Nakachtank, I think I, I hope I said that right, I apologize if I didn't. To that people and other Chesapeake indig indigenous tribes who belong to this land and was violently removed from it. I also want to say the names of Delaney O. Martin, Alante Scott, and Troy Bullock, black community members of Washington, D.C., who have recently lost their lives to, to the police in this city. And I send my condolences to their families and the activists fighting for justice. We have an entire delegation with the George Floyd Global Memorial here with us today. If you are here by my invitation in this room or the over overflow room, please stand. <laughs> this is a group of people who stand by my side in our fight for black liberation. These are people who practice cultural heritage preservation in a way that is changing the industry. While I, am oft, while I am often the face of our work, these are a fraction of the people who are pushing with me until we get to the other side of justice. They are pilgrimage guides, memorial caretakers. Y'all, I promise I'm gonna get through this. <laughs> I did, I did the whole museum experience yesterday and I got myself together after 24 hours and then uh, Brother Brent gave his speech and it brought it all back, so. <laughs> okay. They are pilgrimage guides, memorial caretakers, artists, activists, caretakers of people, art conservators, archivists, gardeners, and people stemming from all kinds of professions in their own right. More importantly, they are mothers, fathers, children, siblings, aunties, uncles, and neighbors to me or to somebody. When it is time for us to gather in fellowship, please meet this amazing group of people. One of our pilgrimage guides could not make it because her daughter was in a car accident, our car accident earlier this month and has a long road to recovery. So we remember and pray for heaven rain. 
Thank you to my family, my mom, Reverend Dr. Judy Austin, who stand by my side and participate in the work of cultural heritage preservation. Thank you to Valinda Carroll, who is here today, and the Black Art Conservators Group, who stepped in as advisors and co-laborers in this movement of preservation as protest. We are learning that to do this work, it truly takes a village. And I would also like to extend greetings to Dr. Carla Hayden, Librarian of Congress, dear sister. It is an honor to be hosted at this historic building and even more so under your leadership. Thank you for trailblazing paths of opportunity for young black girls in cultural heritage preservation just by being you. Finally, I am grateful to the Foundation for Advancement in Conservation and the American Institute for Conservation for hosting the Held in Trust convening. I would like to extend my greetings to the board and acknowledge your generosity to extend an invitation for me and my community to be part of this moment. Y'all, I, I am raised in the black shirt, so I had to get the greetings in. <laughs> <laughs> I have titled this moment of time we are sharing together, starting with culture and cultural heritage preservation. I knew that this phrase described our starting point at the George Floyd Global Memorial, the organization that was created by bringing the family of George Floyd and the community of George Floyd Square together to care for the memorial that the people built. We have over 5,000 offerings in our offering room where we do archiving and conservation. It is not 400,000, thank God. Uh, <laughs> this does not include what is actually outside at the memorial. Starting with culture, which is layered and complex, creates a different kind of operation in preserving our story. So let me give you a glimpse into how we got here. Please play the video. Chicago. This is real.
a space of protest. The art is art of protest. We have redefined what community safety looks like. And you know what we found? Community brings safety. On May 25th, 2020, George Floyd was lynched by the Minneapolis Police Department and it sparked a global uprising. Or in the words of my dear friend, the artist Sean Garrison, it sparked a love rising. People all over the world rose up in protest to the ongoing injustices against black lives, namely police brutality. While the media projected on the news the fires and destruction, destruction, we were experiencing our communities an outpouring of love. But why did the people rise up? While I cannot speak for every person who took to the streets, I can tell you that as black people, we are tired of the legacy of being lynched. To better understand lynching, the NAACP describes it as a public killing without due process, but Stephen Messner, Robert Baller, and Matthew Zevenbergen deepened that understanding by noting that, quote, lynching applies lethal violence for purposes of social control, unquote. The purpose of public lynchings has al always been to create fear and compliance for the living, not our dead. This is a culture that America has created over centuries. And in 2020, the people pushed back on all seven continents to take a stand for justice. And in Minneapolis, we took over the intersection where George Floyd took his last breath. And because the space was cleansed by indigenous elders and protected by black men and women of the neighborhood, the people were free to find community, liberation, public grief, pilgrimage and protest. This context of pain and hope birthed a memorial not just to George Floyd, but to hundreds of stolen lives. The oldest named person in our memorial is Emmett Till, who was lynched in August of 1955. And I refer to him as the first modern day hashtag because of what his mother, Mamie Till Mobley, did. George Floyd Square is first and foremost a place of protest. George Floyd Square is the intersection of East 38th Street and Chicago Avenue South in Minneapolis, Minnesota. It is home of the memorial that the people built during the 2020 uprising for George Floyd and all stolen lives. Every offering that is laid in that intersection disrupts business as usual to signal that there is something wrong that needs to be made right from the smallest painted rock, to cut flowers, to potted plants, to teddy bears, to letters, to baby blankets, to 10-foot fists, to murals on buildings or bus shelters, to the art erected on billboards by BIPOC artists, to the morning passage of 169 names painted onto the asphalt, to the Say Their Names Cemetery. 
These offerings are an extension of somebody's voice, and they beckon us to feel the pain that this culture has opposed upon us and imagine what life could be like on the other side of justice. Because on this side of justice, black people continue to be devalued and oppressed by systemic racism and white supremacy. This protest art has a purpose, and each piece carries the voice and the energy of its maker. That is why we move by two guiding principles. One, everything is somebody's offering, therefore nothing is thrown away, and two, the people are more sacred than the memorial itself. We are people over property all day, every day. It is this second principle that reimagines the work of art conservation. In the summer of 2020, the sky wept in solidarity with black pain. There was so much rain that as neighbors, we began to repurpose bus shelters to store several of the offerings that came in from the protest signs and art. Most of these items were paper. If left unsheltered, the hundreds of pieces of wet paper and cardboard would create slippery walkways as people traverse through the memorial to see what other people laid as offerings or to find the perfect spot for theirs. We used wooden crates to create distance between the offerings and the ground, but this temporary storage only proved useful for a short time. A gigantic dumpster appeared at the memorial one day, and over time, offerings were disappearing. Now, I assumed that artists were reclaiming them, but one day, as I, as I was cleaning the streets, I was about to dump a bottle of Gatorade into the dumpster, but before I did, I peeked into the dumpster to see where the liquid would be going. There they were, hundreds of protest signs that we were trying to preserve. I called Paul Eves, our longest standing caretaker over, and he jumped into the dumpster to hoist them out to me. We knew we had to find a better place to store them. One of our neighbors, Leon, knew the owners of Full Cycle, a bicycle company that employs homeless youth uh, up the street. He inquired about storage space. Uh, on our behalf, they then asked the leadership of Pillsbury House and Theater, uh, where their then co-directors, Faye Price and Noel Raymond, welcomed us with opened arms. They said that we could do our work in their art room while they were closed for COVID. We set the date, June 15th, 2020. That would be the day to transfer the first set of the offerings into preservation. I showed up to George Floyd Square to help load the offerings into a neighbor's vehicle. Our plan was to leave the bundled protest signs on a section of the floor and figure out what to do with them later. It was Nicole Grabo, director of the Preventative Art Conservation at the Midwest Arts Conservation Center. Um, I didn't know, she, she came. I didn't know uh, her name. I didn't know her title. I saw a petite, blonde-haired, white woman who showed up as extra hands, and I was grateful, until she yelled, stop! <laughs> if we are going to store them, we are going to store them properly. I thought to myself, who is this white woman giving instructions in a movement for black liberation? <laughs> she began giving everyone directions on how to lay out each protest sign. Uh, she somehow acquired a fan and gave us instructions to let them fully dry out. And in a week's time, we would return to continue the work. We did. Week after week, we returned and collaborated. She and her team of conservators taught us basic tools and submitted, our black, and submitted to our black leadership of memorial caretakers in every decision that had to be made. We learned that cleansing is irreversible. We learned how to identify mold. We learned how to build our own boxes for housing and so much more. In this process, I discovered that she knew what she was doing. 
And it would be in my best interest to continue to listen and learn about this industry called art conservation. I also discovered that this process would be more of an investment in time than I had initially thought. <laughs> so I struck a deal with her. I said, you teach us art conservation and we will teach you how to leverage your work for racial justice. This agreement is still in effect three years later, and it is why I am standing before you today. Because we are in a movement for black liberation, it was imperative that the art conservators working with us understood the grounding principles. And the most important of them all was people over property. For hundreds of years, black people in America have been treated as property or worse than the property that white people owned or both. To undo racism and live into the imagination of a new world, we would have to start living in the basic principles of that new world. Every offering that came into conservation would first be examined for its story and power. It would be examined to understand what the person who made it went through to lift their voice. All my caretakers were required to sit with each piece they came across and engage it for what it was, a protest. If they needed to cry, cry. If they wanted to scream, scream. If processing with another was essential, do it. Bring your full self to this work. Then, after the story was understood to the best of our ability, the technical conservation work could begin. The art conservators voiced how different this was from their process. <laughs> they named that in their business of billable hours, this kind of process could not take place. <laughs> Additionally, it was a hard pivot to focus on the people instead of the object. If one is trained for their entire professional career to prioritize an object, how do you wrap your mind around operations, procedures, and plans that were rooted in centering people? The answer is you practice in community. The volunteer job description was peculiar everyone receives the community name title of memorial caretaker. And not everything we would do was art conservation. For example, if in the event a rally was taking place at George Floyd Square, memorial caretakers would be present to help people understand their relationship with the space, to not step on offerings, to not potentially injure themselves or another. Then, if the rally were to turn, to unru turn unruly or fires were to break out, caretakers were responsible for evacuating homes and driving children and families to safety. Let the memorial be and we will assess the damage the next day. This was the culture of preservation as protest in an uprising. The culture of a fight for black liberation birthed what I lovingly call street conservation. We used whatever tools we acquired through mutual aid, cardboard, tape, pencils, hot glue, and box cutters helped us build housing for the offerings, sponges, paintbrushes, the sun, isopropyl, and water helped us do things like surface clean, treat mold, and loosen crumpled materials in humidification chambers that we made up ourselves. Y'all, that was so cool. Um, <laughs> we have done what we could with what we were given, and we are still doing it. But why we are doing it? But why are we doing it? Why didn't we just give the offerings to existing museums that would have had conservation resources at their disposal? Because we needed to tell our own story. One of the age-old tools of racism is to get people to misremember and disremember stories. 
This truth is why land acknowledgments are so important. When we know the truth, the truth will set us free to quote Jesus. <laughs> we live in a nation that is not free because we struggle to preserve the truth. Over the centuries and even today, people as agents of white supremacy have curated narratives that did not exist in order for subsequent generations to believe and behave in a manner that perpetuates the oppression of black people and indigenous people and brown people. The academic institutions that are keepers of these false narratives are not safe for us. The museum institutions that retell partial or misconstrued narratives are not safe for us. The art conservation institutions that preserve predominantly white stories or stories that serve the interests of whiteness as an idea are not safe. The fact that there are less than 20 black art conservators in the entire country is not safe for black people. The truth of our stories are not safe only in the hands of people who do not know our experience of pain and hope in their very bones and cannot see our future. And honestly, it is not their story to tell. Mike Hoyt from the Pillsbury House and Theater recently introduced me to a new term that helped me understand our work at the George Floyd Global Memorial, narrative justice. We are in the work of getting the story right. And we are starting with our own. Through our story of the 2020 uprising, our plan is to nurture a new generation of black art conservators, archivists, and story keepers. A generation who will never desensitize themselves from the story that we have carried. A generation who understands that our work is predicated by black death. A generation that will grieve our dead and inspire the living to keep fighting and to get to the other side of justice. Yes, I believe that the field of art conservation would put on the front lines of a freedom movement has the potential to save lives because the telling of the truth begins with us. When we choose to not perfect an offering, the world can bear witness to the scars of that offering, the struggle that someone's voice of protest went through to remind us of what is at stake. We are preserving protest art that was created for the purpose of changing our nation. We are preserving art that is sacred because we believe that the people who created it are sacred and the lives that were lost for these voices to be raised are sacred. And this makes us keepers of the sacred. This makes us a priesthood charged with the work of narrative justice. Yesterday, as I walked through the National Museum of African American History and Culture, the work of our ancestors weighed heavy on me. And I knew that we at George Floyd Square are not the first and we are not the last to, to preserve our story in a way that starts with who we are. I saw a quote on the wall from Maya Angelou it read, history, despite its wrenching pain, cannot be unlived. But if faced with courage, need not be lived again. What happens if we take art conservation or cultural heritage preservation as a whole, place it at the front lines in a fight for liberation, and we do our work with courage, we 
have the power to end lynchings in America once and for all. This is why I do this work. And this is why I need you to change why you do your work. Black and brown siblings in this industry should not have to fight for their people and voices to be centered. You should center them so we do not have to relive the history of this nation, which is lethal for people who are not white and toxic for those who are. We also do this work to build collective power. Where there's people, there's power. That is the message we painted onto the People's Way at George Floyd Square. I saw a quote from Lonnie Bunch III, secretary of the Smithsonian, while at the museum. He said, there is nothing more powerful, powerful than a people, than a nation steeped in, his, in its history. And there are few things as noble as honoring our ancestors by remembering. George Floyd Square is a place of remembrance of our ancestors whose lives were stolen. It is a place where thousands of people from around the world continue to show up and bear witness to our collective history. It is a place where people remember. I will never forget when the American Ballet Theater visited. I was talking with a, make, with a makeup artist, and she said to me that nothing brought New York to its knees like COVID. You could drive down the street without using your mirrors because no one was in the streets. New York was at the height of the pandemic. Then, George Floyd was killed, and people flooded the streets to march. People risked their lives. She told me how important George Floyd Square was to her city, and they took to the streets for justice in our city. They risked their lives so to preserve the story is to preserve the memories of those we lost and the memories of what people did to seek justice for them. And as people see themselves in the memories we preserve, we are building collective power that is rooted in the truth of our history. I have also had the privilege of working with high school students who were middle schoolers during the 2020 uprising. Many of them were not allowed by their parents to participate in the protests with good reason. But now, they get a chance to engage with one of the greatest stories of their generation and add their voices to a collective remembrance because the memorial is still here. The protest is still ongoing. I cannot stress the importance of the work of the George Floyd Global Memorial for this current and future generations. Most people in our circumstances would have given up a long time ago. We do not have the funding we need. We do not own the property we need. We do not have the staff we need to sustain the level of work that we are miraculously doing through the power of being neighbors. We are still fighting to preserve the very city streets on which there are hundreds of names. But we do have each other as neighbors and we have a resolve for justice. We believe in our ability to preserve our story and create rememory experiences for others. We believe that we are preserving and conserving history in a way that will help our nation do better. So we will remain resilient. Preservation as protest. We are disrupting business as usual to signal that there is something wrong that needs to be made right. Will you join us? 
What will you preserve to disrupt racism in your own communities to help create a more just and equitable world? Here's a suggestion. Focus on the people. Start by centering the people of oppressed cultures and the course of cultural heritage preservation and conservation work will change our nation and bring us into the more resilient future we seek. Thank you. I didn't think I was going to be crying in front of everybody, but here I am, Janelle. And um, I don't know if I can say what I was going to say before because I don't really feel like I have to say anything too much more. But I do, so, I do want to share with you this beautiful sculpture by Simone Lee, who um, was, it was created, um, it's a uh, portrait of her friend Sharifa and it was created for the 2022 Venice Biennale. Simone Lee was the uh, first black person to be representing the United States at the Venice Biennale last year and I'm shaking. <laughs> I'm so thrilled to have been able to see this sculpture in Boston. There's an amazing exhibition of a lot of the sculptures that were in the Biennale in Boston right now. If you have a chance to go see it, please do. But this sculpture, I was going to say to you, was just this very beautiful image of introspection, which I felt like was a metaphor for the work that we all need to do, both personally and as a field. We're examining and acknowledging our past and learning from it, taking inspiration from the work, uh, from what it teaches us, the stories it offers us, and hopefully coming into a more informed, community-driven future. Through the work that these speakers are doing, I hope you can see there are ways that we might move through the challenges that we are facing as a field and as a nation. And um, I was gonna show you some pictures and highlight our very exciting um, climate resilience uh, project that the NEH has funded, which is our first deliverable from Held in Trust, which is being delivered while Held in Trust is still going on. But I think we're going to save that for another day because I don't want to say anything more. I think I am full of resonance for what you've shared with us, Janelle, and for what everybody here today from the George Floyd Global Memorial has to share with us as the living, breathing embodiment of the power of preservation. So um, I want to leave you with one quote, and I know Peter's going to get up in a minute, but this is from, um, sorry. this is from Robin Wall Kimmerer, Braiding Sweetgrass which you might have read, but I just want to leave you with this one thought from that wonderful book. So much depends upon the lighting of this fire, a platform of dry kindling, a floor of fine twiglets, a nest of shredded bark, plenty of fuel, plenty of oxygen. All the elements are in place, but without the spark, it is only a pile of dead sticks. So much depends on the spark. And I think we've just seen the spark. And I hope that everybody here today and everybody who is listening today virtually will bring their own spark to this work. We see the way forward. And so we can all bring the spark as individuals, as members of an organization, members of a family, members of a community. Bring your spark to this work so that we can move forward into 
a future and a world where conservation and preservation and justice have everything that they need. Thank you. I too shall be brief. Thank you all. The speakers today have been incredible and I too am incredibly moved by what I've heard today and I congratulate all of you. I also would like to thank Pam for her outstanding leadership as held in trust project director. Thank you. On behalf of FAIC, I would like to thank again our colleagues at the National Endowment for the Humanities for their vision and generosity. I also want to thank everyone who served on the Held in Trust working groups, as well as the FAIC and AIC staffs, especially Lissa Rosenthal-Yaffe, Caitlin Lee, and Tiffany Amig, and also former FAIC Executive Director Errol Wentworth and former Institutional Advancement Director Eric Purchell. Kudos as well. Yes. Yes. Kudos as well to AIC President Suzanne Davis, her immediate predecessor Margaret Holben Ellis, FAIC Treasurer and Library of Congress Liaison Elmer Usman, and Danielle Amato Milligan, who will succeed me as FAIC President next month. Special thanks, of course, to the Library of Congress for providing space for our convening and for sharing their preservation work and commitment. Thanks again to all of you colleagues here with us in person and watching online. To paraphrase something we heard earlier, this afternoon marks only the beginning of a long and exciting journey. We truly look forward to taking that journey with you. Thank you. We're cut off now from streaming, so I can say to those here in the building. With a reception in the magnificent Great Hall. Huge thanks to Conserve and FAIC 